Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another GRA online event. Uh, this one is Tax and Trusts. It's October 2022. And uh, welcome Anthony Lipscomb as my co-presenter this evening. Uh, a few, a few um, preliminary points. Uh, just a general disclaimer that this evening's discussion is generic advice and it's not intended to be individual advice. Um, so we would highly recommend that you uh, take advice from a qualified professional before relying on any information in this presentation. It's very easy to get this stuff wrong and it can cost you an awful lot of money uh, if you get the wrong end of the stick. So take advice before you rely on anything in this presentation. Secondly, we present under the uh, exemptions for chartered accountants under section 14 of the Financial Advisors Act uh, 2008 for chartered accountants. And these exemptions apply to any aspect of a regulated matter that uh, we're covering off in this presentation, pre predominantly stuff around um, finance. Uh, all copyright of the material contained in this presentation is reserved to GRA, and you should get our permission before uh, you use this information for your own purposes. Um, reprinting it or republishing it, we require you to get our permission. And just one last uh, preliminary warning. Um, this, this presentation is uh, being given in October 2022, and we should draw to your attention the very rapid changes in tax law that are evolving, uh, particularly under the Labor government. And as a result, things we say in this presentation could easily become out of date uh, after this month. And so we uh, recommend that you check that if you're seeking to rely on the information that the laws have not changed. And we also bring to your attention that we're under no obligation to warn you of any changes that happen uh, as a result of this workshop. Um, it's up to you to check with your advisors before you rely on the content. So just be aware the laws change because they certainly are changing very quickly under this government. Right, so uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am a Chartered Accountant in Public Practice. I'm the Managing Partner at GRA and I'm a, a busy investor myself. I spend most of my time uh, investing in property these days and I sit on the board at GRA. Um, my background has been in tax and asset planning. I've written a couple of books um, tax Structures 101, I think it was pu first published in 2015, it's completely out of date, and uh, we rewrote Tax Structures 101 last year, but we couldn't publish it because the tax changes were happening so quickly, and we've rewritten it again this year, and it's pretty much ready to publish, but we're cautious about publishing it because there are just so many changes coming through, so we hope to have uh, Tax Structures 101 back in the back in the market, rewritten um, for 2023. Uh, probably 101 is a bigger bigger ask and I'll probably republish that in 2024. Uh, so this evening I'm gonna be covering um, the asset protection and estate planning topics and Anthony's gonna be covering the tax. So for those of you that don't know Anthony, he is a partner here at GRA, um, long time um, member of GRA. Anthony, is it, um, is it 19 years? Yeah, correct. Nineteen coming up. Twenty. You um, you get less for murder. Um, you know that's a that's a very long time. Right. Well, your your um, expertise here is certainly um, uh, above head and shoulders above everybody else in the practice in, in terms of tax, and you're a nationally recognised uh, expert in property and, and taxation. Uh, and indeed, when I when I met Anthony, he came into the team, and after about three years, I realised that. He was much better at tax than I was, so uh, he got he got given control of the tax and asset planning team, and he's trained many of our staff and keeps our compliance practice on the right side of tax law. So uh, privileged to have you here, Anthony, talking to our um, audience this evening. Welcome. Thank you. For those of you that uh, listen to the presentation tonight and think that you might like to get some more information from us, we do offer. Um, free initial meetings for new clients. And if you go to the front page of our web, which you can see here, and you uh, click the top right corner, 
you will find um, contact, request a meeting, and you can book there at, at our web. So most welcome to take advantage of that. So the agenda this evening is a little bit different because when Anthony and I present to uh, the public, we are generally hyper-focused on property. And in the last couple of years, we've kind of been outraged and um, at the same time, very attentive to the plethora of tax changes that have been coming through that have been anti-property and, uh, and, and, and very problematic um, for the property industry. So all of our presentations have been focused on, on tax changes. And we felt that it was timely that we do an update uh, because we haven't really done a, a general asset planning workshop for many years. Uh, we've been focused on tax, but of course, when you're dealing with tax structures, you also need to look at your asset protection, your estate planning, your relationship property, the, the wider planning issues that can, can completely change the way you go about setting up your structures. So this evening's topic is actually about asset planning, and that is the three tenets of, of asset planning, which is asset protection, uh, making sure that your affairs are protected as much as you can from creditors, spouses, um, whatever it is that you're, you might be concerned about. Uh, secondly, estate planning, what to do after death. And then the, the third component of that is tax, which in the perfect structure would be built around those other tenants, the, the idea of good asset protection and estate planning set in place, and then you build the tax around that. So tonight's going to have lots of practical case studies and commercial concepts. Uh, we are going to uh, give you a one-page update on tax changes. Anthony's going to do that. But then we're, we're going to jump into commercial structures that we're using in this environment uh, because I think that's actually um, much more practical and, uh, and much more timely given the amount of changes that have happened that we inform you of, this, of the new sorts of thinking that we have as a practice and the different ways we're going about, about things as a result of all of the tax changes. So let's start there then. Let's look at asset protection and estate planning, and then Anthony's going to kick off on uh, on the tax update and the tax side of asset, asset planning. So uh, I guess asset planning as a process is, um, you've got to define um, what it is you're trying to achieve. And you, of course you're trying to set up commercial structures that are gonna protect you from your creditors um, that deal with your estate and give you the most tax efficient outcome. And when you talk to an accountant about this and you say, well, how should I set up my affairs? Uh, astonishingly, the average accountant is going to focus on their profession, on their background, which is the most tax efficient outcome. So if you ask them about trusts and asset protection, they quite often have a different view of that. They see it as expensive or they see it as an unnecessary layer of complexity and they don't they don't necessarily try very hard because it's not their background they don't have uh, legal concepts in their in their training it's all about tax for them so they'll often be apathetic about asset protection they'll talk about it but they won't try very hard to to nail that stuff down and get it right uh, or they'll stay very nocus uh, very um, narrow in their fo focus so rather than trying to look at, look at things holistically to get the best rounded structure to tick all the boxes for the lawyer and the accountant, uh, they'll perhaps put your home in a trust, but they won't dig into some of the more complex asset protection issues because they, they are legally based and you have to have a, a bit of legal training uh, to do that. Uh, so really the ideal thing that an accountant would do if they're setting up your structures is connect with your lawyer and ask the lawyer to deal with the issues. But lawyers are busy and often don't collaborate that well with accountants. So that can be quite challenging. So conversely, if you go and ask your lawyers, what's the best way to set your tax structures up or your legal structures up, they fall to their training, which will often be very good asset protection, um, very focused estate planning, they'll do a great job of that. And uh, they often don't have a clue about tax so they ignore the tax side of the equation, the structures. Um, and, and lawyers will generally know enough about tax to be very cautious about it. 
So they will tend to not touch things that they know can be litigious or problematic. For example, if you move property, you can trigger um, disposals for tax purposes, which mean you have to pay tax on the on any deemed gains on the residential properties, for example, under Brightline rules, they, they know about that stuff. So they won't tend to want to move rental properties. Uh, they know that if you, well, the better ones know that if you shift shares and companies, that you can forfeit the tax losses if you're not careful or forfeit all of the tax credits paid in the company, all of the imputation credits. Um, so if you, if you lose the losses or you lose the imputation credits, it's a disaster. So lawyers know that stuff. And they tend to stay away from, um, you know, digging too deep into restructuring clients' affairs because they, they can create liability to their client and to themselves. So you get caught in this quagmire where accountants are very specialised, lawyers are very specialised, and as a result, you don't get a great holistic bit of advice uh, that ticks all the boxes. So an asset planner knows both sides of the fence and gives you ideally structures where the lawyer and accountant fit together and it's all working properly. Now, many of you will be my old clients and will have heard me say this uh, in years gone by. Uh, 20 years ago, I was on stages telling people about this stuff. But the tax has changed, and the structures have changed. So really, everything has changed. So this is an update of, of this very old process that we run at GRA. So we're looking at asset protection first. And the first step of um, asset protection uh, is, um, we say, planning for failure. Or another way of looking at it in an asset planner's world, the first step of planning for success is actually planning for, for failure. Um, what would you do if you knew that you were going to go bankrupt next year? And connect with me here, think about your own affairs. How could, um, in your own affairs, you be sued? Could it be that um, you have half a glass of wine too much and drive your car down the road, don't realise you're over the limit, crash into a new Bugatti Bayron or something expensive, new Lamborghini, um, or some fibre optic tower, and you knock out fibre for the area, you're over the limits, you don't get insurance, suddenly you've got personal liability. Um, maybe you're in Australia and you do that, even worse, you get um, you know, much larger penalties in Australia. And the thing about the drunk driving example is there is, um, th there's no insurance. So, you know, could it be that one of your staff members do it? and you have vicarious liability for the actions of your agent or employees? Could it be that your business just harms a third party and as a result of your property development company or your construction business or engineering business or whatever it is you do, that you harm a third party and the liability exceeds your insurance and you get sued personally as a director? What I want you to think about is if you knew you were going to go bankrupt next year because some disaster had happened, what would you do today? Because that's the bar you should use when you're setting up your asset protection structures. And the answer to that question would be you would do everything you can to protect your family from that liability that you know is going to come next year. So with that mindset, you approach things in a, in a wholly different manner. You are very professional about asset protection and you try as hard as you can to protect yourself. And that's our standard when we're setting up asset protection for our clients. So practical things, you might, for example, try and quarantine the problem to a single company so that that single company has the problem and it goes into liquidation and the rest of your affairs are not affected. You might move unrelated assets into other companies or up into a trust you might think about the money that you've got in the business that you might be running that's caused the liability if it is a business and think about making sure that if that money is in harm's way that you have securities over it so that you're first to be paid ahead of other creditors and then the person that's suing you ranks behind you for the own, your own money that you've put into the company. So these are the sorts of processes that a good asset protection person will have for you. So let's look at a failed asset protection structure here. Um, we're going to use lots of diagrams tonight because this, is, this can be a dry topic, but I think diagrams bring it to life. So here's you and your spouse. So let's say that you've been advised to own everything jointly. 
And it's astonishing to us that we still meet clients that do this. You know, they don't use companies and trusts. They have everything in their joint names. So if you have joint ownership of an asset and you trade, that is a deemed partnership under the Partnership Act. And the thing about the Partnership Act is it gives you joint and several liability with the two partners. Um, so that means each of you are 100% liable for any um, liability that arises. So in this circumstance, there's a property development going and a business going. If either of them cause a disaster, that disaster flows through to you and your spouse, your joint and several liability. So both of you cop it and all of the assets get dragged into the disaster. You have to sell everything to satisfy the creditors. So, you know, 101 of asset protection, never trade as a partnership. They are a disaster from an asset protection perspective. They can be quite useful for tax, but don't listen to the accountants if they're telling you to run partnerships. It's, it's very bad from an asset protection perspective. There are better ways to achieve what the accountant needs and to give you asset protection. So uh, a fundamental of, of asset protection is if you own it, it can be taken off you. Uh, whether the liability is against you personally because it's something you've done, or whether it is liability arising through your directorship of a company, and so you're being sued as the director of an insolvent company, the liability tends to track to the directors or to individuals. So one of the best ways you can get around the liability attaching to your assets is don't own the assets, put them in trusts. So in this example here, we've got a separate family trust for the home uh, and we've got separate companies for the various activities. We have a property development company and indeed we'll have a separate property development company for each property development. So that if one of the de developments fail, it doesn't automatically create the other developments to fail because you've quarantined it to a separate company. Uh, we've got separate companies for the rental properties, separate companies for the businesses. So to give context to this, this might be a property developer and business one could be an earthworks business and it's working for the property development company. If that earthworks business causes harm or liability to somebody and gets sued, that company might liquidate, but the property development company would not automatically get taken down and vice versa. So you're quarantining disasters from the other companies and it doesn't automatically contaminate and go across the rest of the group. But it's not just as simple as putting companies in place and putting them in trusts like this. You also have to think about how the liability can flow through the companies up into the trust or what the trustees' liabilities are full stop because often those liabilities can, the liabilities can come from the trust and go down into the group and then you lose, you lose everything in the group. So think about um, how liability gets into the trust. And of course, um, the first thing that springs to mind is guarantees from a banker. If you are providing guarantees um, from the trust in relation to the company's activities or other group members' activities, those guarantees mean that the tr trust assets are automatically available to satisfy any problems that, that flow out of the, of the companies that are trading. So banks are normally the parties who get into trusts. Sometimes more sophisticated creditors will ask for trust guarantees. So let's go back to that prior slide. Um, if that development company has banking in it and the banker who lends the development company takes the guarantee of the business trust, then that banker gets rental company one, uh, business company one, the whole group. But if that development company, when it's borrowing money, says that you can't have the shareholder guarantee, you can only have the director's guarantee, then you've quarantined the banker to the company alone. Now that, that might sound um, too good to be true, but that's exactly what you do. And if the bank is demanding the shareholder's guarantee, form a new trust and migrate the company off into a separate trust so that the, the shareholder guarantee isn't worth anything. This is how you've got to think if you're going to defend yourself from an asset protection perspective. And remember, the bar is you're going bankrupt next year. What would you do this year if you knew next year it was all going to come to an end? This is the sort of thinking that you do. Uh, of course, you'd never give them your family trust guarantee. They'll ask for it. Don't give it to them. And while we're here, they're most likely going to ask for your spouse's guarantee um, and, and just, you know, just, just say no. Um, 
if you don't ask, you don't get. They'll always ask. But, you know, my wife has never guaranteed my banker's obligations, despite the extensive banking that I, that I do through my property activities and various business activities. So just say, no, a spouse guarantee is not available. Um, and if they push it, you say, oh, why do you want my um, wife's guarantee or my husband's guarantee? Is it because if I fail as a business, you want to bankrupt my wife who's got nothing to do with it? That's not very nice, is it? So you just push back on moral grounds. And, and they. Um, I've never had a bank uh, push back on me on that. So um, control guarantees. Don't give the shareholder guarantees as a right to the banks. They're going to ask. They're going to create a term sheet. They want this. They want that. Cross it out. Say, we'll give you this, we'll give you this, but you can't have that. You've got to control those, those um, term sheets that are issued by the bank. Um, so another thing to think about in terms of how liability gets up into the trusts is um, representations that the trust makes. So for example, if you have a trust that is selling shares in one of your companies, uh, that trust is, is at risk of misrepresentation claims. I've got a diagram of, uh, of that coming up for you, but I have seen clients that have sold large companies and uh, their trusts have got sued because the companies have failed after they've sold them. So I'll show you that with a diagram in a moment. But let's start with um, bank securities. And what I've shown you this many times if you've been in my workshops, this is uh, split loan structures and avoiding cross securities. So here we have the family trust and the broker has done the easiest thing they can for themselves and the banks. They have taken security on the home and lent the money into the rental company and the development company. And that is a terrible banking structure. It's probably the most common banking structure, but it is a terrible banking structure. Because if the development company fails or the rental company fails, everything is cross-linked and the bank starts winding everything up and they take everything and uh, you get the last dollars that are left. Um, so that, you know, that's a um, terrible structure because you, you, you have no control over the banks. Also, if you sell an asset in a down market, and it's quite timely, um, you know, the market's in recession at the moment. Um, if you sell an asset in a down market, um, you, you might want liquidity. So you might sell a couple of rentals to pay some creditors and get you a buffer. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you've got some issues. Um, you know, if you, if you want that money to get through, you might not get it because the banks seem to take full proceeds uh, if they've got these types of structures where no matter what you sell, they take full proceeds the moment you sell them because they've got these cross securities. So um, if you have a disaster, it affects everything, they take everything, or um, more likely and more practically, if you sell something, they're going to take the money. And if you need it, that's not useful. So as an alternative, split loan structures are very um, powerful structures to, to break the banks up. So for the development company, if they want 40% equity, you might take the 40% loan against your family home and check that, and then go to bank B, another bank, and lend the 60% in there. And in the same way with the rental company, you'll pull 40% off bank A and put 60% off a third bank, bank C, and try and break all these banks apart. So when you sell things in your rental company, whatever proceeds you get, there's no cross security, you get full proceeds to take for your affairs. Uh, bank B is, is the same. If, you, if your developments come to a conclusion and cash up, you get all the money back into your development company to pay off bank A um, or to go again in, in another development. So breaking the banks apart, splitting the loans up like this, split loan structures is um, a very effective way of setting your structures up. Now we preach this in an up market. And everybody's so hell-bent on buying houses that they ignore us. Their brokers just get them the money and they do whatever they want. Now we're in the down market. People who have uh, done this, cross-secured everything, are going to experience exactly what I'm talking about. The banks will take full proceeds, and if they have a problem, they lose the lot. Uh, and also, when you're in this situation, one bank, because they're so big, they're such a large um, dominating uh party to your to your affairs they start to control you so they'll say things like oh this is a this is a very adverse market you want to buy another property or you want to start a business we don't think that's prudent in this environment so actually we're not going to give you any more money and they might even say things like we want you to start selling because we think you're overexposed interest rates have gone up 
But if you've got this sort of structure, that doesn't happen. You've broken the banks up and you, you remain in control. So that's just a vastly superior way to control your banking. So this is asset protection and financing structures. Um, so, and that just demonstrating that if you did lose a development, Bank C and Bank A aren't necessarily affected. So I mentioned that uh, you've got to look at how liability can get up into your trusts. And one of the ways is bank guarantees of the shareholders. And if the trust is the shareholder, that, that gets the trust up, the, the bank up into the trust, then they get all of the other companies um, owned by that trust. Uh, so I guess the point of that is don't give the, the banks the guarantee of the shareholders if the shareholder is a trust and owns other assets. Um, another way you, you can get into trouble from an asset protection perspective is when you sell um, the shares of large businesses. So here we're going to sell Big Business Limited. It's a decent sized company. It's got a value of five million and we're going to sell the shares to a purchaser. What else is at risk? You might look at this and think the rental company is not at risk because there's no cross-company liability. If, that, if Big Business liquidates, um, there's no shareholder liability to the trust. So the liability does not flow through to the trust and down to the rental company. So we've quarantined it off, which is, which is good. But think about what happens if uh, Big Business Limited is, par is passed over to the purchaser. They've paid the five million to trust one. And then it turns out that there's a problem in Big Business Limited. It doesn't perform as projected. The purchaser is going to be angry and they typically look to the vendor of the shares and say, you sold us something that um, wasn't what you said it was. That's misrepresentation. So they sue the vendor of the shares. It's very common. They sue the accountants. They sue the lawyers. They sue the um, real estate agent who was involved in selling the, the shares. They sue everybody but they, they sue the trust that sold the shares. So suddenly that problem, that is the purchase's problem in big business becomes a trust problem and the trust owns your rental company. So the better way to deal with this situation is have a separate trust for the rental company and quarantine that transaction to a single trust so that trust one sells to the purchaser and trust two owns the rental company. So that if they do sue trust one after you've settled with them, uh, they can't get at your rental company. So this might seem abstract and it might only affect 1% of you that, that are out there. But if you are thinking of selling your business, uh, I've seen this in practice and um, it is something you should be thinking about. Let's talk about gifting. Um, gift duty, of course, was repealed in 2011. And for those of you that don't remember gift duty, uh, gift duty uh, taxed the transfer of capital uh, when people were trying to pass their capital into a trust for asset protection uh, or for relationship property reasons or um, back prior to 1992, we had uh, 1991, we had a state duty in New Zealand. And uh, so people used to try and set trusts up so that they had no wealth so that when they died, there was nothing in their estate and their trusts were rich and they were poor. So gift duty was brought in as part of a state duty to try and stop people from asset stripping themselves into trusts. So around 2011, the government in power at that time, I think it was the national government, said this is ridiculous. Um, gift duty is a hangover from a state duty. It just makes lawyers and accountants rich. Let's, let's repeal it. If you want to gift everything to a trust, you can lump some gift and there's no, there's no dutiful gift in that. Uh, and so that's, that was an excellent thing that happened in 2011, and it allows you to instantly gain asset protection uh, as long as at the time you make the gift into your trust, you're solvent, and you're not setting out to defeat specific creditors. Um, uh, otherwise, the gifts become voidable. So as long as you're not insolvent and you're not trying to beat somebody, then um, you can lump some gift, and that gives you asset protection behind the trust wall. If you don't finish your gifting into trusts, then creditors can attack your trusts. And that's because when you go bankrupt, the official assignee steps into your shoes. And if, if you've lent a trust some money, you go bankrupt, and the OA, who is the um, insolvency, the public insolvency uh, 
party that steps into the shoes of bankrupt people and deals with the assets and liabilities, if they step into your shoes and that trust owes you money, they will demand that the trust repays that money to you, uh, to, to, your, to the bankrupt's estate, and uh, pull that money out of your trust. So ungifted loan balances are a disaster if you have them. You've really got to deal with this. And so many lawyers and accountants are slack in this area. They don't follow through and get their clients to gift off loan balances. So um, a little deeper, if you have trusts that you've lent money to and you haven't finished gifting uh, and you also have companies as beneficiaries, which is very unusual these days, but if you do have a company as a beneficiary, and even more unusually, your trust has been making distributions to a company as a beneficiary, then when you uh, forgive the debt to the company, it actually becomes taxable. So you can have complications in that area with the accruals rules um, under, under tax rules in New Zealand. So just be aware, if you've got a company as a beneficiary and maybe it's got losses, so you've been allocating income down to it, uh, and then you start forgiving debt, then that debt forgiveness can become taxable. So just be very careful to take advice around that if you've been doing that. Uh, another thing just to think about with gifting is rest home fees. And we're going to talk more about uh, the Ministry of Social Development and how they collect or how they govern who can get um, rest home subsidies and how that correlates to gifting. But pretty much, um, if you lump some gift these days and there's a substantial amount of money involved, um, say above $255,000, if you're lump sum gifting more than that, then you won't be able to uh, beat rest home fees for, for want of a better term. Um, so lump sum gifting is not good for, for beating rest home fees. I'm gonna give you a bit more detail on that. But let's first look at uh, ungifted loan balances. So um, asset protection, typically involves gifting to a trust. And as I said, um, as long as you're solvent, when you make a gift, you're not setting out to defeat creditors, then um, you're getting asset protection inside the trust. Um, but if you haven't finished gifting, this all comes unstuck. Um, so there is no gift duty anymore. There's no excuse for not having your gifting done. Check, check with your lawyers and accountants. Open If you're doing trust financial statements, which you should be doing, um, open them up, and if if the if you have set all loans or loans to you, um, money that you've been lending in, sorry, loans from you to the trust, money you've been lending to the trust, that's what you need to gift off. And it's easy to overlook this because over time you can be transferring additional wealth into a trust. Maybe you got an inheritance, you banked it into the trust bank account. What was that? That was a loan. Uh, maybe you got some shares. Uh, maybe you got a windfall um, or you sold a rental property that was in your name and you put the proceeds into the trust and pay the debt down of your family home. That is a loan advance to the trust. So what you need to do is to make sure you pick that stuff up and gift it off to the trust. So let's look at a case study. Um, this, this is an ungifted loan balance case study. So John has a business manufacturing electrical circuits for large power stations and infrastructure assets. Um, we'll call it Eco, Electrical Company Limited, Eco. The company makes $2 million a year pre-tax and for many years has traded successfully um, until one of the Eco customers blows up and burns to the ground and the fault is traced to Eco's faulty work. And Eco gets sued for $100 million because it's an infrastructure asset. So John and his wife, Sarah, get sued, and they are both directors of the company. The insurance is insufficient to cover $100 million, and they lose the case, and they're bankrupted by a vindictive plaintiff who's very angry about the, the situation. And the question is, what do John and Sarah lose? And the answer to that is in the detail. We need to know what they were doing. So let's have a look at what they were doing. They had a trust, and that was set up by their lawyers, for asset protection, and the trust is actually worth $13 million. They've got a batch and a home, and that adds up to $13 million. And uh, they set the trust up for asset protection. And when they originally transferred the batch and the home to the trust, they were worth $5 million. So they loaned the trust $5 million. 
Uh, but for whatever reason, between their lawyer and between their accountant, they didn't gift that $5 million to the JS Family Trust. And so now um, they've had a terrible disaster in the company. The company's gone into liquidation. They've gone bankrupt because the directors have been held liable for the actions of the company. And as a result of that, the creditor claim goes straight through against the family trust for the $5 million. So that trust is going to have to raise some debt or start selling assets and repay that $5 million to the creditors um, because the lawyer and or accountant didn't gift off those loan balances. So whose fault is it? Well, um, uh, the uh, John and Sarah are bankrupt, aren't they? So they're actually no longer in control. They wanted to sue the lawyer and accountant. They're not in, they're not in control. So they're going to feel very victimised here. Um, they they have to get the LA to take a claim, um, and you know that's, that's not going to help them. So even if they want to sue the lawyers and accountants, it's very difficult for them. They're at the worst time in their lives, and they're wanting to hold someone accountable. Actually, I would say to you, you're accountable for the stuff. Your trustees, you set these structures up. I'm warning you, this is a terrible thing if you haven't done it. Make sure that you've gifted your loans to your trusts. Um, and it's a, it's a natural thing that happens over time. You transfer assets into trusts. Every now and again, you just need to do sweeping gifting statements that say the last 10 things we've put into the trust, we're going to gift it into the trust. Um, it's a good thing to raise with your client service manager if you're a GRA client um, or with your lawyers and accountants. So um, let's now look at uh, what would happen if they had finished gifting. So here they've gifted the loan balance, they go bankrupt, they carry on living in their batch and their home, the creditor has no claim against the family trust. It doesn't matter if they are trustees of that trust or beneficiaries of that trust, um, that is not going to give the creditor the right to jump into that trust and take the assets, as long as the trust is properly run and properly constituted. So let's talk a little bit about rest home fees now and uh, essentially your eligibility for subsidy of rest home fees. So we're probably thinking about this in the context of your parents, but also in the context of your affairs um, with your children. So, you know, can you beat rest home fees or, um, you know, are your rest home fees going to come out of your, your um, asset base and then your kid, that comes, effectively comes out of your kid's inheritance or upstream to your parents, same concept. So the Ministry of Social Development set the rules on subsidy eligibility. And they say that you have no eligibility if you've lump sum gifted above the allowable thresholds. So the annual threshold is actually 13,500 per spouse. And if you add that together, that's $27,000. That often gets conflated with the original 27,000 per annum number that um, was exempt gift duty back in 1991 and right up until 2011. But um, that, they're not the same thing. That's coincidental. So the um, way this works is if, if both spouses have been gifting 13,500 each in perpetuity, it, the Ministry of Social Development won't touch that money. But if you've gifted more than that, then any sum exceeding that um, can be clawed back or, or can make you ineligible for, for rest home fees. So 13,500 per year per spouse um, is an astonishingly low, low number. And with asset values inflated to where they are today, um, it's, you know, you're not going to be able to lump sum gift and get away from rest home fees. Um, you just won't be able to do it. Uh, there is another layer to this, and that is uh, there is an exemption uh, where the first 200, circa $256,000 is reserved for the estate, for the children, beneficiaries. So if you have a house um, and investments worth $256,000, then you're going to get rest home fees. If you have $257,000, they're going to take $1,000 off you, then, they, then you'll get eligibility for rest home fee subsidies. That's how it works. So let's have a, look, a case study where we compare a trust where uh, mum and dad have bought a house for 130,000 in 1990 
and gifted it at 27,000 per year each to a trust and can and compare that to uh, a mum and dad who lump sum gifted a million dollars to their trust in 2015 and just compare the outcomes. So uh, the 1990 trust, they gifted 130 grand at 27,000 per year and that house is now worth $2 million. So it was worth 130 and it's inflated to the value of 2 million. So the trust has got a capital gain of $1.87 million. So that's not a transfer of wealth from the mum and dad to the trust. That's a gain to the trust, a capital gain of the trust. And so that $1.87 million uh, is not clawed back by the Ministry of Social Development, or it's not taken into account for the eligibility for rest home fee thresholds. Um, there hasn't been a transfer of wealth. And the 256,000 exemption applies. So given that 256,000 is greater than 130,000 transferred, the asset test is satisfied. And this trust, despite being rich, um, may very well get um, eligibility for rest home fee subsidization. The MSD are still going to debate it and have an argument with you. If there's income available in the trust um, from any asset, then they're going to want you to spend that on rest home fees um, and you will have a debate around that. But if all the money's tied up in the house, in these circumstances, it's highly likely that you'll, uh, you'll end up getting eligibility. If we compare that to the 2015 trust where a million dollars was gifted to the trust, um, 2015, 2011, whenever it happened, um, and it's now worth 2.2 million, the trust has got a $1.2 million gain that gain is the trusts, the MSD are not looking at that. They're looking at the million dollar transferred and they're saying, well, that exceeds the threshold of 256,000 by 744,000. So they're gonna require the trust to cash up 744,000 before you're eligible for rest home fees. And they'll also be looking for other income in the trust if it's there, they'll require you to use that. But this is just giving you some visibility on how um, rest time fees work with gifting and uh, you know these these matters get addressed. Uh, there are some other other considerations here. If if your only asset in a family is um, a family home and it's owned personally, and two spouses alive are alive and one is in care, then uh, in that circumstance you do get eligibility as long as there's no other income available to pay the rest time fees. So they don't tend to say to the second house who's living in the family home, oh, you have to sell the house or raise some finance. And um, you get eligibility while the two spouses are alive. But as soon as the first spouse is deceased um, or the second spouse goes into care, then they want that, they want that house sold. So it is tempting for people in the circumstance where two spouses are alive, one is in care, it is tempting to wrap a trust up to gain the exemption because a trust precludes you from getting this exemption. This exemption only applies if the, if the house is owned personally. Um, so trusts get in the way of this exemption. It would be one of the few times that we would say a trust is a disadvantage. Um, but if you do wrap the trust up, then of course the um, surviving spouse would, would um, have those assets exposed to a subsequent spouse if they get remarried or their creditors. So something to think about in the background. So let's look at a case study here, um, bringing to life another, another um, angle to this. Uh, Maria and John are both 85 years old. John owns a house that he's owned uh, pre-marriage for 50 years. So it's worth 10 million, it's a very valuable house. So he owned this before he got married and he's owned the house for 50 years and it's worth $10 million. Um, John is now terminally ill and he goes to his lawyer and he sets up a trust with his wife as the beneficiary and his children as the beneficiaries. And he leaves this $10 million home to that trust via his will. So this is different because there's not a disposition through gifting. This is an estate. There's been no gifting. The trust inherits the house. So Maria should qualify for rest home fees if there's no other income or assets. Um, this is not simple. Um, MSD tend to fight over this stuff, but um, you know, that is something that some people do and it, it can be effective. Uh, let's now look at another asset 
uh, protection concept, and that is the concept of securitizing your own money going into your own business activities. This is um, an excellent uh, concept to understand from an asset protection perspective. Um, essentially, it's saying when you lend your money to your own businesses, you should behave like a bank and take securities over your own money. Um, if you put security over your own money going into your own businesses, if there is a disaster, you can appoint a receiver and control a liquidation. And most critically, your funds are preferential, meaning you get paid first. So, uh, you know, you might say, well, what if I want to pay the creditors because you think it's the right thing to do? Well, of course, you could waive your uh, securities and pay the creditors that you want to pay. But we have seen across the years sometimes quite un, um, unfair things happen to our clients. And if you've got these sorts of structures in place where you've securitized your money, then uh, you can make sure that you're paid first and then pick some of those creditors that you think it's right that they should be paid and pay them yourself. But if they are just, um, you know, vexatious litigants coming after you for something that's not your fault, for example, a third party's done something in your affairs um, and their liabilities come back to you, you can liquidate the company, take the money and restart and this protects you. So I'm going to show you how this works. So GSA stands for General Security Agreement. Let's say your trust is going to fund a property development company and it's going to loan $2 million down. So if you look at the balance sheet of that company, there's an asset of $2 million and the, it's funded by your shareholder loan of $2 million. There's no equity. And let's say that uh, just after you've done this, the company has a claim of $4 million against it. You have a financial disaster. So the balance sheet now changes. It has your $2 million of um, loan as a liability and the litigant's liability of $4 million. So there's $6 million of liability. And if we look at the balance sheet, you've got um, 2 million of asset divided into 6 million of liability. So everybody's going to get 33 cents in the dollar because you've got 2 million of asset divided into 6 million of liability. So that's a ratio of 33 cents in the dollar. So you as a, your trust as a shareholder, it gets 33 cents, which is 667,000. And it writes off 1.33 million. And the litigants claiming 4, claiming 4 million they get 33 cents, which is 1.33 million, and they write off 2.66 million. So that's how the 2 million gets split up, 33 cents in the dollar. And that's the job of a, of a liquidator, and that's what happens uh, when there's no GSAs over the company. Let's now <coughs> presume that you're a bit smarter than this, and when you advance the 2 million down, uh, you put a GSA over the company, and then you had a financial disaster. So now your money is preferential. The GSA is a security, secured um, advances get paid first. So the shareholder, the first two million goes to your trust as the shareholder. The litigants get nothing and uh, they are unsatisfied. Their four million just goes unsatisfied. So you can literally pick the balance sheet of that company up and move it to another company, start again. Um, you do have to watch phoenixing rules with directors um, and rebranding, and there's, there's more to it than what I'm saying, but most certainly you get your money back and you're first in the queue if there's a disaster. Um, I will say, as I said, some people find this, these sorts of structures unethical. And what I would say to people that say that is it's not the structure that's unethical, it's what you do with it. So if you want to pay the creditors out and waive your securities, go for it. But as I said, I've seen some particularly hostile things happen to our clients across the years. And these securities give you a real advantage. So you can pick and choose who gets paid is what I'm saying. So that in a nutshell is um, some asset protection tricks for you. And remember the context of this is, we're talking about asset planning tonight, three things, asset protection, estate planning and tax. And I've just gone through various mechanisms that are excellent for you to employ inside your structures for your business activities, for your property activities um, that will give you much better protection. Okay, let's move to estate planning. Um, so your <clears throat> second aspect of um, 
asset planning as estate planning. And your will covers what's in your estate. So if you think about it, if you have completed gifting and asset stripped yourself to a trust, there's nothing in your estate. So therefore your will is not really quite so relevant to your asset base. Except um, it's still very important that you do a will when you, when you do a trust because you need to specify who controls your trust after death. So I've had clients come to me, they've set up trusts and they've done new wills for their trusts and they said, oh, can you review my trust and estate? And I said, sure, I'll have a quick look. And I opened their will and it's got their first wife in as the executor of the estate who under the trust becomes the appointor, which means they have the power to hire and fire trustees. So if you're on spouse number two or spouse number three, do you really want spouse number one? You might have children too who's annoyed because you haven't paid enough childcare. Do you really want them suddenly running your trust after death? I don't think you do. So that's why it's really important to check your wills are up to date. And when you do a, a, a trust, make sure that you deal with this power of appointment. Uh, typically, it's going to go to the surviving spouse, but not if you're a blended family where you've got kids to prior spouses, etc. So I'm going to show you a bit more detail on that. Um, of course, you're going to make some personal gifts through the wills. You might um, have specific chattels that you want to go to parties. Um, you might want to appoint the guardians of your children, if you've got um, infant children or young children, uh, and just make sure that control of your, your personal affairs and control of the trust, the succession of that goes to the right people. Um, another aspect of your will is that it will typically say anything that is left in your estate is left to your trust. Because you could, for example, have won lotto the day before you died and your, your estate is then wealthy. So you don't want that to have to go through gifting programs, which creates asset protection issues and MSD issues with rest home fees. So you, you leave everything to the trust, basically. I'm going to show you a picture to make it simple. Um, but best practice um, from our perspective with estate planning is that your spouse should inherit via trust. Your children inherit via trusts. And of course, if your parents die, you should, should inherit via trusts as well. Let me show you this. So this is a wall, this vertical wall, and it denotes risk. So on the right-hand side are people. People carry risk because they have creditor risk, spousal risk. And so if you have assets in your name, the assets can be taken off you. So for asset protection reasons, you don't want to be owning your assets. So put trusts in place. So your parents, if they leave your share of the estate to a family trust, uh, then if you go bankrupt, it, that money can't be taken. So that's why you direct your parents to leave your share of their estate to your trust. Uh, you and your spouse do new wills, leaving any residual asset ungifted or in your hands to your trust. You then line your trust up to flow down to separate trusts for your children. This is the concept of an inheritance trust. Your children inherit via separate trust set up for each of them. Now, this is not a feeding frenzy for lawyers creating all of these trusts. These uh, children's trusts can be created after death by instruction through your memorandum of wishes, which is an additional document attached to your will that leaves wishes um, for that you intend for your trustees. So it can say things like, I prefer that my children inherit their share, their pro rata share of the proceeds of the trust via a sub trust, which is created after my death. And, and so then that trust is created as part of um, the implementation of your estate. And the, the trustees actually do it in conjunction with the executive of your estate. So your will, your memorandum of your wish of wishes, um, and your trustee all get read in conjunction with each other. And it's very important that you get that bundle working together to achieve this sort of outcome. Um, and across the top of that, as I said, you've got to look at governance. So do you want your surviving spouse to have control of the trust? Probably, but, but maybe not if they are um, not good with money um, and, for example, have drug addiction issues um, or probably not if they have a blended family situation, children to prior partners, and it's your specific intention that they don't take over your family trust. So it's situational. 
And this is where a good advisor, a good trust advisor will sit down with you and work this stuff through. It gets really complicated. So what if you want to have separate relationship property? You know, you look at this, if you and your spouse don't want to join your relationship property into a single trust, that's not going to work. So what if you want to keep separate asset bases? And what if you have children to prior partners? You know, if you die first, um, will your spouse look after your kids as you intended? And will your kids get their, in, in their intended share? 40% <clears throat> of New Zealand get divorced. So this is a um, factor for, for, you know, nearly half the country. So I want to show you a blended family of um, a, a lady that I came across maybe 15 years ago now. It's an excellent example of a blended family issue. So uh, she um, was in this situation where spouse one had children to a prior spouse and they came together with spouse two who had children to a prior spouse and they had children together. So we had the blue children, the green children, and the yellow children. And uh, regretfully, spouse one died. Then my client came along. She was spouse three. And she had children to a prior spouse. And she met spouse two. And they had children together. And spouse two died. And so... The question is, what chance do the blue, green, and yellow children have of competing with the purple and the pink children in spouse three's estate? And this is a blended family. It's an extreme um, version of it, but I, I, I had spouse three as a client. And she was a delightful woman, and she wanted to treat all of the children equally. But not everybody's like that. Some, you know, it's quite possible that the blue children or the green children hate spouse three and are litigious. You know, that could easily happen in this situation. Or spouse three hates the children and doesn't want them to have any money because she prefers her children. So this is a real issue and you need to collaborate carefully with your lawyers over these sorts of issues. Um, and let's look at a, at a one way of dealing with it. So. Let's say uh, you are in this situation, you might have two trusts and a relationship property agreement, RPA. So uh, a Section 21 agreement uh, or a relationship property agreement records that you have separate rights and entitlements. And um, you would uh, run your estates through your own separate trusts because your spouse can't attack your trust. And therefore you can be assured that your children get their share because it's not going to become subject to a relationship property claim. So your parents can drop your share of their estate into your trust. You have your will going into your trust. You leave somebody else in charge, not your surviving spouse. Um, if you're concerned about them, other people will put their surviving spouse in. It's up to you. Um, it's, it's up to your individual circumstances. And of course, your kids to the prior relationship have separate trusts uh, or to them personally, whatever you want to do. And then you can have separate assets. So here we've got separate companies and we're just showing the way through separate structures. You can quarantine your affairs from their affairs. Now, I will say that you don't need to have trusts to get a separation of assets. You can go to your lawyers, set up relationship property agreements, and keep all the assets in your own name. But in the context of this is estate planning. But when you overlay asset protection and tax, because we're asset planning, we know that trusts are better. So if your goal is to get that, those asset protection goals and some of the tax planning goals that Anthony is about to show you in the tax slides, then you're, you're, you're going to want to use trusts because they're more tax efficient. And so then you start to have to overlay your estate with your asset protection goals and your tax, and it gets more complicated. So this diagram is getting busy. But it just demonstrates you can have a wall between what your spouse is doing with their money and what you're doing. And you can have joint assets between the two trusts if you want to have things 50-50. You might, for example, have a home 50-50 between the two family trusts, but keep separate investments in your separate trust. So as a quick summary, uh, trusts are fantastic for wealth succession. Um, wills work very well with, uh, with uh, trusts if, you, if they're set up correctly. If they're not set up correctly, then they're a disaster. So that, you know if they don't, pass the governance through properly, or if you're not directing the wealth to where it's supposed to go to, it doesn't work. So make sure you, you 
rework your wills um, when you set up trusts and make sure they stay current. Um, deal with your power of appointment after death, because that is quite a common thing I see that's out of date. And just make sure your money goes through to your trust and then from your trust to subtrust for your kids. Uh, deal with relationship property and blended family issues as part of your estate. It's a very important part. And I will add that if you're going to put an, a relationship property agreement in place, you're going to need independent lawyers for each spouse and it becomes a bit of a rigmarole, uh, but it's necessary. So if you're wanting to do that, you're going to need two lawyers. And then once you've got your estate plan worked out and your asset protection worked out, you're going to overlay tax. So these, this is the, the great debate of lawyer working with accountant. You need good lawyers and accountants working together to get this stuff right. Um, one, one last comment, and that is uh, sham trusts uh, are trusts that the, the trustees have failed in their duties. And, and as a result, um, when the trust gets tested by a court for relationship property reasons or for creditor protection reasons, say you've gone bankrupt or a spouse is trying to break into a trust, uh, if you haven't performed your duties correctly or if the trustee is not constituted correctly, then uh, a court will very quickly deem a trust to be a sham. And uh, if, if you have a sham trust, the assets revert to being personal, which means they're taxed personally, they're available to creditors and available to spouses. So know your duties as a trustee. You should know the trust deed and the terms of the trust. Um, you should act independently dealing with beneficiaries, know who the beneficiaries are, um, act prudently uh, and prepare proper records like um, you know, a schedule of assets and liabilities and keep a record of trustees' decisions by writing them down and getting them signed. Uh, and there's more to it and it's deeper than that, but for a veneer quick discussion, I'm sure you've heard the term sham trust. It's a trust that fails as a result of the trustees not discharging their duties as trustees. And the, the consequence of a sham trust is the assets become available um, as personal assets to whoever's trying to get those assets be it IRD or, or a spouse or a creditor. So do financial statements, do minutes. And actually, when you're acting as trustees, meet as trustees and prepare minutes and resolutions. Um, it's not strictly legal that you have an independent trustee, but if you do have an independent trustee, a third party that does their job and writes things down with you, that makes your trust much stronger. Conversely, if they don't do their job and they don't write things down, that's evidence of a sham in itself. So make sure you're all acting as trustees and performing your duties as you should. Okay, there's a there's a, a quick discussion on asset protection and estate planning. And I haven't had that discussion for five or six years um, publicly. Um, and we used to do that all the time. So we thought it was high time we, we talked about those issues. Anthony is now going to come in and uh, take over and go through tax and trusts. If you want to see the in-depth discussion on tax changes, we filmed these last year and some of you will have um, attended. So October the 27th, 2021, we went over the detail of tax changes and we've filmed various updates uh, and they're on our web. Uh, you can see the link there. It's under um, seminar recordings. You'll find them on our web. Um, this presentation will end up up in this area. So um, if you want to go into the detail of tax, that, that's where it is. But actually, Anthony's just going to give you the short abridged version tonight. Anthony. Okay, so the abridged version of uh, recent tax changes. So we're going back to March 2021 when the government dropped something of a bombshell that, that most people did not see coming. Um, number one, the bright line period, which at that point in time was five years, was extended to 10 years. So that means for properties bought on or after <clears throat> 27 March 2021, the bright line period is now 10 years. Now that is subject to a carve out for new builds. The, the uh, government wanted to ensure that if they did extend the bright line period for 10 years, which they're doing to try and dampen the property market, that it didn't necessarily dampen supply. So they, uh, as you'll see in a moment, when we talk about the other measure that they undertook to try and dampen uh, property speculation and 
uh, even the level uh, level of the playing field, I should say, for first home buyers, there's a carve out for new builds. The idea is to encourage supply of new housing. So that was the first change was what was once a five year bright line period is now a 10 year bright line period, but only applicable for property bought on or after the 27th of March, 2021. If you already owned a property that was outside the bright line period or subject to a five year bright line period, it continues to be subject to the same rule. At the same time as extending the bright line period from five years to 10 years, they changed the main home exemption. This is a fantastic change if you make your money as a tax advisor because what should be a pretty simplistic definition of a home that is exempt is now uh, infinitely more complex because now we've got one main home definition if you bought your property before 27 March 2021, we've got a new one if you buy it after 27 March 2021, and then we have different home exemptions depending on whether we're talking about the Bright Line rule or whether we're talking about other land tax provisions. Uh, so fantastic job of obfusc obfuscation uh, undertaken by the legislative drafters there. The main point to note is that if you do have a property that is your main home and you move out of it, you can still get under these new rules, which apply again for property bought on or after 27 March 2021, you can get some relief for the period of time that you lived in the property, but it'll be pro rata. So if you lived in a property, for example, as your home for two years before renting it out for four years and selling it after six years, then one third of your capital gain would be exempt due to the main home exemption, two thirds uh, subject to tax. The real unexpected change that was announced in March last year was the denial of the ability to claim deductions for interest expenditure when money has been borrowed to buy residential rental property. So a bit of a mouthful there, but basically the guts of it is, if you are a residential rental property owner, then you're going to be paying more tax unless you qualify for one of the exemptions. The exemptions, which is to say, if you fall into one or two of the categories that I'm about to mention in a moment, it's business as usual for you. The interest that you incur is deductible as it was pre-March 2021. So the two exemptions where you continue to be able to claim interest deductions, just as you historically have always been able to do, is if the property is a new build, or if you are renting out an existing property as social housing via um, either Kainga Ora or a community housing provider. If you are not renting out a new build or renting out a property as social housing, then your interest is either going to be completely not deductible, which is the case if you bought the property on or after 27 March 2021, or if you had the property before that, unfortunately, even though you bought the property at a time when the rules were completely different, you didn't anticipate this change, you still get clipped by it, but you get a four-year transition period during which time your interest deductions are progressively phased out. Uh, many people may be aware of this. And again, I refer you to the webinars that Matthew uh, mentioned and, and uh, had up on the slide a few moments ago where we've got some more detail on this. If you have, Bottom line is, if you buy a property tomorrow and it's not a new build or rented out as social housing, any interest that you spend on money that you borrow to buy that will not be deductible. If you have a rental property that you owned pre-27 March 2021, then at the moment, you can still claim 75% of your interest as deductible, but come next tax year, that'll be dropping to 50% will be able to be claimed as deductible, the following year 25%, and then the following year, none at all. The final ch rule change in the context of income tax and residential rental properties is rollover relief. And I'm going to give an example of this in a moment. But Matthew's talked a couple of times so far about needing to be careful if you're restructuring the ownership of residential property. And what he's specifically talking about there is that if you own a rental, residential rental property personally, let's say you bought it two years ago, 
in uh, 2020 and you want to restructure the ownership of that, say into a trust, because you're thinking about long-term estate planning and you're conscious of asset protection. On the face of it, and this is not a home, this could be a holiday home, uh, this could be a rental property. On the face of it, if you transfer that property into a trust, then all sorts of bad things happen. Because you bought it two years ago, you're still within the five-year bright line period. So you might have to pay tax on the growth in value from 2020 until now. Secondly, the trust will be acquiring the property in October 2022 at a time when the bright line period is 10 years. So your five-year bright line period that was about to run out in 2025 is now extended to 2032. Furthermore, the interest that you can currently claim 75% of as deductible because it's subject to the phasing out rules would be completely non-deductible in the trust because the trust again would be seen as a new owner in October 2022. Even the government thought that that would have been a relatively harsh outcome. So what they have decided to do is to allow for rollover relief to apply in certain related party transfers. If rollover relief applies, it means that when you transfer the property into the trust, you can avoid having to pay tax even if you're transferring in the bright line period. The trust is not subject to a new 10-year bright line period. It inherits the original bright line period. And you do not lose the ability to claim interest deductions. If you could claim 75% of the interest deductions before moving to the trust, you can claim 75% after moving to the trust. There is a limit on the scope of the, the application of that provision. It doesn't apply to all related party transfers, so it is important to get advice. But that was definitely a welcome addition to that legislation that eventually passed uh, earlier this year. One other recent legislative change which we want to mention tonight is in relation to trusts and disclosure when filing income tax returns. From the March 2022 income year onwards, the information that you need to include in an income tax return has expanded quite significantly. Uh, prior to this, a, a tax return for a trust was four pages along with the extra page maybe for a um, disclosing distributions to beneficiaries. But now you're going to have to disclose any settlements to and from the trust. You're going to have to disclose not only the amounts of beneficiary income distributions, but who the beneficiaries are, their tax details, if they're non-resident of New Zealand, where they're resident, their tax details in that country. You need to disclose who holds the power to appoint and remove trustees. You need to prepare financial statements. So quite a significant uh, broadening of your compliance obligations where you have a trust. And if I, if I might just intervene and say these um, rules are ridiculous. Um, there's no tangible benefit to the government and there's significant cost and hassle. So our, our attitude towards the rules is we try and get our clients out of them. And um, Anthony and I shot a um, statutory change um, presentation for on the new trust disclosure rules. We shot a short um, webinar on it maybe four months ago. And it's, it's up on our web. It's actually up on the front page of the web at the moment. So if you want to know how to get out of those trust disclosure rules, um, as far as you can get out of them, just, just to reduce your compliance costs, then um, watch that presentation. Yep, yep. And so we're talking non-active. You need to, your trust to be non-active. Yep, no um, income. Yep. Yep, try and get out of them. So um, on, to, on point here, John asks... You suggested putting your family home in a family trust. If that was done, but it was done late, if it was done and later we wished to sell the family home and buy another one or take the family home out of the trust again, how would those transactions be impacted by bright line rules? Well, the first point there is if it's your main home, then you don't need to worry about bright line because you will qualify for the exemption. Uh, second point, Transferring a property into the trust, you can get rollover relief. At the moment, transferring a property out, the circumstances in which you get rollover relief are pretty narrow. You've got to be, you have to have transferred the property into the trust in the first place. 
So that means if you bought it directly in the trust, or if it's the third property that the trust has owned after you transferred one in many years ago and then sold that one to buy another one, then you won't get rollover relief transferring the property out. Hopefully, though, um, by first quarter next year, there'll be new legislation that will broaden the instances where rollover relief will apply transferring properties out of a trust. Uh, Stephen says GSA or registered mortgage um, over the assets of a company, both, Stephen, both. Um, Grant says R2 trustees okay, must you have three? Uh, you can have one, Grant. One is enough, as long as they do their job. But it's prudent um, if you want to be much more effective to have an independent trustee, um, or um, it's mandatory that the trustees prepare minutes and resolutions and um, you know, discharge their duties as trustees. And you've got to be able to prove that you did that. Um, I'll shut up and let you carry on, Anthony. Um, okay, so we will move on to talking a little bit about tax, tax rates, trusts uh, subject to flat tax rates of 33%. Uh, that's a watch this space issue. It, it's not uh, inconceivable that if the current government gets re-elected or our former coalition with the Greens in government, that the trust rate may go to 39%. The trust rate, though, is only a ceiling. It's not a floor. Trusts can allocate income to beneficiaries. Beneficiaries got to be 16 or older. Uh, for any income more than $1,000 to be allocated in a tax-effective manner. Companies pay tax at 28%, and individuals are subject to varying rates of tax depending on the income that they earn. They start out, start out much lower than the company in tax rates at 10.5 and 17.5, and now end up higher than both of those rates for income over and above $180,000, where the tax rate for individuals is 39%. You need to be careful about changing structures. We've already talked about some of the risks if you're moving property around. The recent tax changes mean that you risk triggering bright line restarts, uh, losing interest deductions, but there is rollover relief there. You've got to be careful in the current banking environment. You really need to get advice from your bank or broker of the proposed transaction before you pull the trigger, which is to say it's best to get it right at the beginning. So if you're looking to buy property, start a business, get the structure right at the beginning, it saves you the issues that might otherwise arise changing midstream later on. Here's an example of a couple that are building a rental portfolio and a, a structure that they uh, might employ. The facts are that Bob and Mary have a rather sizable rental portfolio that's that's running at $100,000 taxable profit. Bob is salaried earning $180,000, which means he is going to be subject to the highest rate on th of 39% on any income he earns above that. Mary doesn't have an independent source of income. She looks after their three children who are very well aged from a tax planning perspective at 16, 17 and 18. So what structure would be helpful for Bob and Mary to be running if they had the rentals held directly in investment trust? And actually, I should say, as an aside, you can see the home uh, owned separately in the family trust. That's consistent with the recommendations that, that Matthew's made or the suggestions that Matthew's made uh, already tonight. But in this case, we've got the rentals owned directly in a, a rental trust or an investment trust. And the reason for that is I mentioned a few moments ago that trusts are currently subject to flat rates of 33%, but that's not a ceiling. Sorry, that, that, that is a ceiling, I should say, but not a floor. The rate can be lowered if there are beneficiaries who are subject to lower rates. So in this case, we've got three children that are all age 16 or older. We've got Mary, who's not earning income from other sources. And that means that $100,000 of taxable income can be spread amongst the three of them getting access to the lower rates. And so here is a summary of uh, the benefits of that. If we compare it to the alternative, which is 
Bob and Mary continuing to hold or holding the rentals personally to the extent that any rental taxable profit is returned in Bob's hands, it'll be subject to 39%. But if those properties are held via the trust, then we get income splitting to lower rates because of the fact that Mary and the three children are beneficiaries of the trust. It is worth noting that the trust rate, again, is 33%, which is higher than the company rate of 28%, so you don't get the benefit of that. But if we're allocating income to children and a non-income earning spouse or partner, then invariably the tax rate is going to be much lower than the company tax rate even when that sits at 28%. The next structure we want to look at is Mana and Tui. So similar facts in terms of the rental portfolio, but the key difference here is that both Tui and Mana are earning, and they're both earning high incomes, and they do not have children. The structure, therefore, that we would look to implement for Tui and Mana is different to, or subtly different, you might say, to Bob and Mary. So we would recommend that in this case, Tui and Mana have a rental company. So we've got a company here where the shares are owned by the investment trust rather than having the properties held in the trust itself. Again, family home sits in a separate trust to the side. Now, the benefit of this structure is that Tui and Mana can take advantage of the company tax rate of 28%. That's lower than the trust rate as noted of 33% and obviously considerably lower than their personal rates of 39%. There's a slide next up which summarizes these benefits. A point of detail to note on the company tax rate of 28% is that is temporary, not the final rate of tax. Dividends eventually come out which means that you end up paying the 5% additional tax to bridge the gap between the trust rate and the company rate, but it's still beneficial to get a timing benefit of deferring that 5%, and that timing benefit will get better if the trust rate goes to 39%, as I've mentioned, as possible if there is not a change in government. Having a company-owned rental properties can uh, lead to some challenges later on because it is harder to extract capital gains from a company, but not a, an insoluble problem, but something certainly to be aware of. You may well ask, given that we've talked about rentals being held in a trust and rentals being held in a company, what about look-through companies? Uh, many people uh, listening tonight may well be aware of LTCs being the predominant structure for residential rental properties. Well, the fact of the matter is there've been so many changes uh, over the last few years that the use of LTCs has definitely declined significantly. They had their heyday when not only was interest still deductible, but interest rates were well, a higher and higher, although of course they're going up now, and when losses were not what we call ring fenced. So back in the days when there were regular tax losses being produced by rental activity and the loss was not ring fenced, LTCs were very much in vogue. But now we have ring fencing, we have interest non-deduction rules, which means that there's not going to be losses, there's going to be taxable profits, therefore LTCs are less useful. But that's not to say that there's not a place for them. For every rule, there is an exception and there are still some cases where LTCs can be useful. I've talked about the possibility of the trust tax rate going to 39% if Labor gets re-elected. So what about if we crystal ball gaze and say, well, what would happen if we ended up with a National Act government? Well, both of those parties have said that they will repeal the interest non-deductibility rules uh, both have said they'll change the bright line rule. I think National will look to, uh, they've said that they'll get rid of the 10 year rule act, uh, want to get rid of bright line altogether, I believe. Both have said that they will abolish the 39% tax bracket. At the moment, as far as we can tell, they're both silent on lost ring fencing. In fact, Matt, Matt you had some uh, insight from National on that, I believe. 
Well, this is probably a good moment, Anthony, to take a short break and invite our guest speaker, because I, I contacted uh, David Seymour this afternoon and said, David, what's your position on tax changes and um, repealing the ring fencing rules? And uh, David very kindly agreed to jump on, and he has jumped on. So welcome, David, um, from, uh, from ACT, the, the leader of ACT. Uh, welcome this evening, and thank you for coming. Yeah, no worries, Matthew. Thanks for having us on. And um, good evening, everyone. We're, we're here um, at Parliament at SIT, still 10. Uh, so all sorts of uh, lunacy is occurring just a couple of corridors away from my office here. Um, and uh, because we're outvoted, um, we can only protest at it, which we do vociferously. Um, just thinking about this whole issue, I mean, first of all, uh, the government has made a major category error in that their intention, they say, is to help people who are vulnerable. Um, but they seem to have missed the memo that you don't help vulnerable people uh, by attacking their landlords, uh, because that whole process of somebody, you know, saving up, buying a place, getting it up to healthy home standard, uh, you know, doing the tenancy agreement, doing the maintenance, and, and all that is entailed with being a landlord, um, the harder you make that, the, the less of it you get, and the very people you're trying to help get hurt. So they made a fundamental error there. Uh, and you can say that for the mortgage interest deductibility, that should go, um, or at least be restored, probably more accurately. Um, the bright line test was always a mistake. And now it means that, you know, you get more empty houses because who would take the risk? Um, and the increasingly uh, complex income tax uh, brackets, which in fairness, Labor and National have contributed to. I mean, we now have a system with six different income tax rates from 10 and a half up to 39 on personal income tax and a 28 on company and trust, uh, which leads to enormous complexity. Um, X view of the world is that we'd like to see two tax rates, 17 and a half and 28, uh, aligning the top personal income uh, with the um, uh, 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 trust and company rate. Uh, that possibly is bad news for the Gilligan Rose of the world because um, the amount of work to be done circumventing uh, tax law would be dramatically smaller, but that's the whole point. Um, in reality, uh, Matthew's an entrepreneurial guy. He'd find ways to help people uh, grow wealthy in, in a myriad ways without having to rely on complex tax law to get around. Um, and actually that's true for the whole country that it could be better off if we spent less time on envy and tall poppy um, and compliance activity that doesn't actually make the boat go faster. So for us, it's getting to two tax rates. The Nats want to get rid of the 39, which is the right thing to do. Um, just as a small factoid, I was asking David Parker, the revenue minister, how much extra money does this um, uh, tax at 39 cents raise as a percentage of government spending? And the answer is 0.42%. So when they say if you get rid of the 39 cents uh, tax rate, you know, there'll be no hospitals and no schools and New Zealand will be back to some sort of Mad Max scenario. The simple fact is that 0.42% of current government expenditure is funded by that tax rate. And I could find you 0.42% waste just like that. Um, so, you know, they're misleading people um, when they say that. One way of putting it is that um, the zero, the 39 cent tax rate is raising enough revenue to pay for the merger of RNZ and TVNZ and the firearm register, both for different reasons, uh, very dangerous and silly policies. Uh, so look, we, we get rid of all of that. The Nats, frankly, want to keep Labor's tax policies other than the 39 cent and then adjust the brackets for inflation. We believe New Zealand's at a point where it needs some real change. Um, when it comes to um, the, the ring fencing, Matthew got in touch today and, and um, you know, I got to be honest, I mean, I, I did speak out at the time, I can recall pointing out that um, rental property is no different uh, from any other business. If you have multiple businesses, um, then you can actually share losses across your whole corporate entity or your personal interests. Um, I don't see why it would be different because one of your businesses was renting out a property. Um, but it's similar in a way to the mortgage interest deductibility that uh, they've got fairly consistent tax law across the whole gamut of human activity. And then when it comes to being a landlord, you're a bad person who needs to be punished. 
um, and that's very much the difficulty that uh, a lot of tenants or would-be tenants living in motels uh, are facing right now because the government made that category error I spoke about at the beginning. Um, so in principle, yes, that the thing I got to say and be honest is that um, we didn't price uh, an end to loss ring fencing into our alternative budget, um, but we do actually need to do that because we believe in principle the policy is wrong. But as Matthew notes, the, the Nats are silent on that too. Um, I have to say with um, the, the changes we propose um, to tax rates, it might not be as relevant anyway. So that's the long and the short. And if I could just get one more little thing in, um, you know, tax is a consequence of government spending um, mm -hmm. and a deficit is just borrowing money today in order to tax in the future. So really, um, you know, you shouldn't think about tax as much as you should think about spending. That's the fundamental mistake that Liz Truss made in the UK. She was she was, she wanted to do the tax cut bit, but she didn't do the hard bit, which is controlling the spending. Um, so we got a government that's taken expenditure from 87 billion pre-COVID to 151 billion in the year to June this year. Um, that inevitably means a whole lot of tax either now or in the future. Um, and X a lot more robust about this. I mean, our um our, uh, our alternative budget, you know, we cut spending by 7 billion straight away. Um, and in the context of the increases they've made, that doesn't sound like a lot. Uh, but actually, you know, if you're prepared to, um, to offer tax cuts, then you've got to be prepared to do the hard bit and reduce spending because spending is the ultimate driver of tax cuts. And uh, a lot of people need to ask, you know, can we afford this on a, on a whole range of reasons? So I've probably talked enough. You've got Two accountants and now a politician. I don't know what you people have done to deserve all this, but um, uh, that's, I hope, I hope no, that's, that, that's awesome, David. Thank you for coming at short notice. I'll tell you, I, I contacted Paul Goldsmith from the Nats and said to him, uh, you know, what are you doing about ring fencing? And he said, it's a question of cost, which is pretty high for this issue. He says he'll check, but probably something we'll confirm um, close to the election. So it's basically I, I, the same answer as us. Yeah, I just think that the um, the issue hasn't been on the um, radar for the Nats or ACT, and we're pleased to bring it to your attention because I think uh, for the property investment community, this is a really important issue, especially with interest rates going up. Because if you look at it, if you can't deduct it and you start paying interest on uh, you know rent minus operating expenses, you're paying tax on that because you don't get to deduct the interest, but then you have to pay all the interest. That's going to send a bunch of landlords broke. Government haven't got that on their radar. But if you allow interest deductibility uh, and they're paying interest at 8 or 9% because Adrian all spent so much money that he's created so much inflation that we have to put interest rates up to 8 or 9% to slow it down. Um, if we end up in that cycle and we can't deduct that interest, then a bunch of people are going to go broke. So I just think that that... that valve that used to be on the property economy that when interest rates went up you got to deduct it you got a tax refund when interest rates went down you pay tax that valve's been taken away by that mechanism it needs to go back in place thank you very much for coming we really appreciate it short notice no thank you matthew and uh, good luck out there everyone and uh look uh, let's do a deal if you give us your party vote then um, we will fix up some of these policy miscalculations that have hurt not only you, but a um, whole lot of other people that depend on property in different ways too. We very much appreciate it. And uh, as you know, GRA are behind ACT and getting you guys into power with the Nats. That's the A-team. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Anthony, back to you. Excellent. We that have... A, that was a welcome drop in. I just thought that if we, um, if we could get the... I was trying to get um, the shadow minister from National to come in from, I couldn't pull that off at the same time, but I tried. <laughs> um, no, Anthony, just, just well yeah, yours. We are going to look at another structure here. Jin and Lee, who personally own a home and two rentals. There's debt on the home and there's debt on the rentals, totaling $2 million. They also personally own the shares in a company that runs a business. The business is highly profitable, making $750,000, and these significant plants and equipment with a value of $2 million. The question that we now need to ask ourselves is how would we restructure this? Because what we can say immediately is that the current structure is not ideal. 
uh, depicted in the slide, the current structure, here we go, uh, shows how Jin and Lee own everything personally. We've got the home, we've got the rentals, we've got the company. And that means if there is any issue with, say, the company and the business uh, that leads to director risk, the home and rentals are exposed to that. Uh, we've also got non-deductible interest in relation to the home and the rentals now. And it's a poor long-term structure. There's not the same ability to put in place an effective estate plan. We haven't mentioned the situation with children, but we'll say that they're mindful of that as well. Yep, no income splitting ability, etc. Yeah. Yep. Here's how we would prefer the structure to be arranged. We'd like to have a uh, family trust, which unfortunately that's missing at the top uh, right hand of that slide, but you could, the home that you can take from me, that's owned in a family trust. Yeah, it fell off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we would shift the rentals into a rental trust. And you might ask why a trust rather than say a company? The reason for that lies with the rollover relief rules that I was talking about. We've got to be care very careful about changing ownership of rental properties. We don't want to unnecessarily trigger tax to pay under the bright line rule. We don't want to restart the bright line period. But if we move from Jin and Lee personally into a rental trust, we should be able to qualify for rollover relief. So that's why we've got the rentals in a separate trust there. That also aligns with some of the structures that Matthew talked about earlier, where you keep your property and your rentals separate from your business. The shares in the business company are moved to a business trust. And here we've gone a step further and we've also separated out the ownership of the plant. There was around $2 million worth of plant here. And what we'd like to see is that insulated from business risk. If we have a company that's dedicated solely to holding the plant and leasing it to the operating company that runs the business and bears the risk, then should there be a business catastrophe, the lease it can be pulled back, the plant's then protected, and our clients have a chance to go again uh, if they wish to. The borrowing, which was previously non-deductible because it related to the home or it related to residential rentals, well, that could potentially be restructured in this structure. It could sit in the business trust because the business trust will need to borrow to buy the shares of genetic uh, Jin and Lee, or it could sit in the plant company uh, with the security remaining the same, still secured against the residential properties, the rentals and the home. So this structure provides a myriad of preferable outcomes, better asset protection, better long-term tax outcomes with shares and properties held in trusts, uh, better deductibility of interest. Um, Anthony, I Right, can you see that now? Yes, I can. Okay. So the, there's the family trust reinstated, uh, shown as owning the home and also the beneficiary of uh, life insurance. That's that's also an advisable move. Have your life insurance policy documented with the trustee or trustees of your trust. You don't put the name of the trust. You don't say Lipscomb Family Trust. The insurance company will not accept that. But you put the name of the trustees as the owners of the policy. And that means if the insured party dies, then the proceeds flow directly into the trust, which is better than them passing into the estate of the deceased or passing to the surviving spouse, where there could then be exposure to risk. A, another variation to the same set of facts is where Jin's mother wants to give Jin $2 million to help he and Lee have a good life, but they want to be able to do that, get the benefit of the $2 million without Lee being gifted $1 million through the application of relationship property legislation. So not uncommon. Parents want to look after their children, uh, but they want that benefit to, to rest with their children and their grandchildren. And if there's a dissolution of the relationship, they don't want the departing spouse to take all of the assets or take a half share of that uh, capital, I should say. So a separate trust to be used here, plus what we call a Section 21 agreement. So that's a prenup or a relationship property agreement that would stipulate that that capital is separate. And then it's loaned from Jin's trust to the family trust. Then it can be used within the family structure for the benefit of the family. But if there is either a creditor event or if there is a, a 
separation of the relationship, that $2 million can be pulled back and it's kept um, for the benefit of Jin and his children um, as the mother wished. It really does bring together an example like this where of, of how lawyer and accountant working together is so much stronger because here you've got the lawyer doing the relationship property agreements and the asset protection stuff, the accountant planning through all of the tax and they're coordinating things together to, to get a much better outcome for their clients. Uh, what about moving to Aussie? That's a really problematic area that we have lots of clients um, debating. Um, Anthony, this is a good area for you to be advised sure. about. So let's look at Dave and Maria who have a portfolio of rental properties owned personally and they flip between New Zealand and Australia. They're wondering what the appropriate structure for them is. And we have to be very careful here. If it were not for them moving to Australia, then we could move pretty quickly here to advising that a rental trust be put in place so that income or asset can be protected, good estate planning and income can be split to Maria. But if you are moving to Australia, we've got to think about Australian tax. We've got to think about the possibility of CGT applying to New Zealand assets. And that could be very undesirable if these properties have been held for a lengthy period of time, which means they're outside the New Zealand Brightline rule, for example. So you're not going to be taxed here. So just, just to be clear, CGT is capital gains tax. We don't have capital gains tax in New Zealand, but Australia has full-blown capital gains tax and... Uh, your New Zealand assets have Australian capital gains tax applied to it in addition to Brightline. So CGT um, applies to New Zealand assets from Australia if you're not careful. Sorry to cut on Anthony, but not, no, even, no problem. Good, not everyone knows point. what CGT is. Yeah, 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 good point. Yep. There is an exemption, though, and Kiwis can qualify for it. It's called the temporary resident exemption, even though Kiwis hold what are known as special category visas, which basically allow you to stay in Australia on an indefinite basis. That's still regarded as a temporary visa as far as immigration rules are concerned. And as a consequence, you can qualify for the temporary resident exemption, which means that foreign income, which would include rental income on New Zealand properties or gains on selling New Zealand properties is exempt from tax in Australia. The catch is, that an individual can be a temporary resident, but a company can't be a temporary resident. A trust can't be a temporary resident. So we'd have to be very careful here about whether or not we move properties into a trust, even though it might be advisable from a New Zealand point of view, because it might then inadvertently drag properties into the Australian tax net. The clients may in fact be better holding the properties personally if they're going to remain in Australia long-term uh, and continue to qualify for the temporary resident exemption. All right, now, if they did decide to stay in New Zealand, and I've already uh, foreshadowed this, then we'd be very focused on asset protection. We'd be looking to move properties into a trust to get income splitting. Um, some other things, though, that they might be interested in, uh, there, there might be a desire for whatever reason for there to be some an anonymity in terms of the properties that they own and the, the name that's registered on the legal title. They also think about succession, but they know that if they restructure, they don't want to be saddled with any negative consequences under Brightline or lose what ability they have to continue to claim some interest as deductible over the next two and a half years. So what structure would satisfy all of these uh, outcomes? One which sees a family trust owning the home and an investment trust owning the rentals. And if there is a desire for anonymity, you could employ uh, the concept of a blind trustee. That means that you have a company acting as trustee of the trust with a director and shareholder that's not the uh, couple in question, or you might have uh, individuals, but more, more likely a corporate trustee with a third party director and shareholder. Obviously you need to find uh, the right people to occupy those roles, but that would then mean that there's not that immediate visibility as to who owns the, the properties. It doesn't change outcomes from a tax point of view. The income is still taxable income of the trust, which can be allocated in this case to Maria, where there'd be lower uh, tax rates. The important point is though, that transferring the properties into a trust should be able to be done in a manner that qualifies for rollover relief. 
So we should be able to avoid uh, nasty consequences under the bright line rule and the interest deduction rules. And you would want to make sure that you get your banking right. In a perfect world, as we've il illustrated here, the home would be released from all securities, the rentals would be standalone financed, and therefore the, the home's tucked away nice and safely in a family trust. But the state planning in there too with the kids trusts and the memorandum of wishes. Yes, so you, uh, although not shown in the diagram here, you would have trusts for the children as Matthew discussed earlier, um, and they would spawn out of the family trust then eventually the capital will pass through the family trust to the children's trusts and you would uh, stipula stipulate uh, how you want that to happen, when you want that to happen in a memorandum of wishes. Very good. Thank you, Anthony. Um, excellent presentation as always. I'm going to summarise uh, and, and to say that uh, if you're interested in asset planning, if you've, if you've got some ideas surrounding asset protection, uh, that's come out of this that you think could be valuable in your affairs or if there are tax planning um, ideas that you're interested in or estate planning, uh, Anthony Lipscomb runs our tax team here at GRA and he is uh, the consulate professional and uh, just excellent in this area. So does it, perhaps you've got GST issues or um, tax problems um, that were IRD are attacking you with or uh, maybe you just want to get your structures checked. Uh, that's what we do here at GRA. So just jump on our web and request an interview. We have at this stage of the cycle, um, heading into recession, found a bunch of people are getting thrashed by IRD at the moment. Um, their dreams um, aren't working out as they planned. Interest rates have gone up. Assets are not settling. Uh, a few of them are having problems with unpaid taxes. Uh, and IRD have become very aggressive um, as the coffers of the government have got shallower. Uh, they've been ordered to become a lot more aggressive, I think, and we're seeing that with the way IRD is treating um, much of the public of New Zealand. They're calling up debts and being very tough on people. Um, they, weren't do they weren't doing that during COVID. So if you are having trouble, uh, talk to us if you've got arrears with debt or if you've got aggressive tax audits or technical disputes. Um, get in touch if you need help in these areas because um, to have somebody that's really competent on your side that can push back makes all the difference, gives you confidence and often we get things settled uh, for amounts a lot less than IRD are demanding uh, and that's just because of our te technical expertise. So get in touch if you need help in this area. Uh, meetings can be booked directly through Amy Bro. Uh, amyb at gra.co.nz on the screen here or you can ring her at our main office uh, or you can book on the front page of our web just hit the contact button in the top right corner and click request a meeting so that is um, a wrap for tonight but now we have some q a and i thought that we would try and answer as many q a questions as we can so i'll just open those Hans says, would be great if you can touch on points and hints of items to watch out for for, the, for setting up a normal trust mid-financial year. Hmm. Well, um, Hans, when you're setting up a trust, uh, you need to be very careful if you're moving assets into the trust. You have tax disposals on residential properties that can cause you to pay tax on the deemed gains. Um, so if you bought something for a million that's now worth one and a half and you're selling it within a bright line period, you can be taxed on those gains. Um, you, of course, with interest non deduction rules, you um, immediately lose interest deductibility on your debt if you move the um, you know, residential investment properties up into a trust. Um, you, you lose deductibility once you shift the asset across. Um, if you're moving shares in companies, you forfeit losses if you move more than 50% of the shareholding, more than 51%, actually. Um, and you lose all of the tax credits paid in a company. Uh, so more to it than that, but uh, and Anthony Lipscomb in the tax section is going to show you some tricks to try and avoid some of those downsides, but you, need to, you really need to pay, um, pay attention to that stuff as you're restructuring. Also, debt deductibility, you know. 
how do you make the debt deductible? It could be that you've got non-deductible debt over your home or residential properties. Are there ways to make it tax deductible? And Anthony's got a slide on exactly that point. Uh, another question here is what uh, from Hans is what are the benefits of a trust if I end up non-resident? And so we've got a slide on Australia. I don't know if you're going to Australia, but um, Anthony will talk about um, moving to Australia and how trusts work over there. William says, my elderly parents own their average, um, their own average rural house, which requires significant renovation. They both receive pensions. Uh, they can not get funding from a bank due to age to renovate. Could setting up a family trust with trustees who will be the adult children of the parents, where the trustees will be the adult children of the parents. Could this get around this? Um, I think is where this is going. Uh, so William, I think that it's best that you go back to your broker with that. And I think that if you can convince the banks that after the death of your parents, you will carry on an ownership because the trust is for the wider family, uh, that should be an effective way to do that. Um, it might be if you've been talking to an existing bank and you go to that existing bank and you propose that, they'll say no. Um, so just change bank, go to another one and and change the application. Instead of saying, oh, this is why mum and dad were trying to get around these rules, <laughs> triple CFA rules, presumably, um, and they're age discriminating. Instead of saying that to them, say, oh, look, our family has formed a trust and this is a family asset. Apparently my parents are the two beneficiaries living in it, but when they die, um, other beneficiaries, the kids will move in and we're all going to be jointly and severally liable on the debt. If you phrase your questions like that, I think you might get a better result. And a good broker should be able to help you do that. Uh, Raya says, BNZ have, have stopped you being able to split a fixed loan and a trust to, to a money offset account. You can still offset in personal names. If I borrow against my personal name in an offset account and pay that money fully off in the trust, which I intend to be 100% offset, um, I'm not sure, this is getting too deep in for me. I'm not a mortgage broker. Um, so, Raya, I recommend you talk to someone like Chris Peterson uh, at uh, Chris Peterson Mortgages and or Ryan Smut. Um, those guys over there are really good at this sort of stuff and they'll go through mortgage offset accounts with you because um, that's the sort of thing that they do. Uh, Steve Elliott um, says, I'd like to hear your thoughts on trusts and residential care subsidy schemes. Also, could you clarify the right doctor by retirement or retirement unit? Is it considered an asset? Mm. Okay, Steve, so I kind of covered um, half of that. Um, so the right to occupy, if you have a right to occupy a dwelling, then the value of the dwelling gets reduced by um, the lease that you would otherwise get on the asset for the statistical age of death. So let's say you're 60, and statistically, you're going to die at 82, and the property is worth 30,000 a year then the, to rent, then the value of the property actually is reduced by 22 years to your age of death um, times 30,000 a year, the present value of that money. So it's a very long-winded answer, but that is something that people do to try and get around rest time fees. So Anthony Lipscomb, if you're there, I haven't looked at that. For years I've been so donkey deep in property. Do people still do right um, rights to occupy? I don't know if Anthony's even listening. He's probably getting a cup of coffee. Um, you still there? No, it? sorry, I am. I am there, Matt. I was just yeah. the wrong button. Yeah. I wonder though if the question is actually driven at um, whether a license to occupy that somebody might own, say, two spouses are living in a retirement village. They're not in a rest home. They've bought a a, a, a license to occupy a unit in a Ryman village. It, it could be either way, but yeah. I think the most the most common question relates to. Um, oh, I see what yeah, it could be either way. If it's a license to occupy because you're sixty and you're saying I have the right to live in the house for the next twenty two years, it reduces the value, which then yeah. reduces the eligibility, makes the eligibility easier to achieve through rest home fees. But I don't know. I'm not. I'm not that up with the MSD stuff. Do you? Do you have any um, comment on that? 
above what I've said that I don't know. No, no, that that that, that life interest that you're talking about, I yes. I can't tell you the last time that I saw that implemented. Yeah. Um, so that's... yeah, I I I think that's a sort of dinosaur. Um, there, there can be uses for it, say, in the context of estate planning, where you've got. A blended family and you want to make sure that the surviving spouse can live in yes. the house but but you know not as a tool that's of any advantage to you when it comes to uh, eligibility for the residential care subsidy yep yep and you've you've had a few scraps with the msd on behalf of clients and come out on top of most of them have you got any tips um beyond what i've put in those slides I don't think there's anything else there matt i i think that it's fair to say that msd uh, a, a fairly aggressive in their approach, which, to be honest, it's what you expect of uh, any uh, government employee holding the government purse strings. We want them to be careful with our hard-earned tax dollars. Yep. Um, uh, but th th there's there's certainly uh, little prospect if you have a, a sizable asset base or if you have property in today's market, as you've already said, sitting outside of a trust the probability of you being able to live long enough to gift that at a low enough rate to fall within the, uh, the allowable thresholds is pretty improbable. On the other hand, if you do have situations where it's say your parents who set up a trust a number of years ago, completed their gifting a number of years ago, uh, mm -hmm. or we've got a relatively low asset base, but still above the threshold, that's where gifting is um, far more viable, where you're far more likely to qualify for the subsidy. Yeah, or death. Death is also a useful um, mechanism. I know it's not a, yeah, I don't not a particularly it viable tax often, strategy, but, but um, I, I have seen clients use it, yeah. Um, all right, uh, another question here, just stay online, Anthony, because a few, few questions here. Um, if you have mortgages on your rental properties, can you still push them into the trust or do the rentals need to be unencumbered? Well, Trevor, um, you can certainly um, move properties with debt on them into a trust. But if those are secondhand residential properties that are not getting the new build status, then uh, the downside is that you'll lose deductibility from the date that you move them through. Yep. Or social housing, of course. Yeah. Yes. So there are there are exemptions, and um, there's a thing called rollover relief, which Anthony's going to tell you about, which yep. will give you an exemption from that problem of losing deductibility. And if you're using them for social housing, that's also exempt. Um, so the answer is yes and no, and maybe. <laughs> and I'll let, I'll let Anthony give you the um, full answer to that um, in the tax section. Sherry says, why do we need to have the business trust on top? We already put business and rentals in companies and having a family home and a separate family trust, are the risks already managed? Well, Sherry, they, they would be. Um, and that is an excellent structure if you've got a separate business trust or family trust. But where you start selling a business to a third party, then the vendor trust is making representations. And that means the other assets of that trust can be taken if there's a disaster. So it's in the very narrow circumstances and context that you have a larger business selling to um, you know, a litigious purchaser and that business collapses in value and they see your trust can be prudent to have that trust stripped of any other asset so that if they sue the trust, it's protected. So Lisa on the same question says, can trust one and trust two have identical trustees and still remain completely separate? Yes, but you do have sort of a pragmatic issue of explaining that to the OA and creditors if there's a disaster. So we would typically use corporate trustees, which are companies acting as trustees and have separate ones for each trust just to keep a bit of separation, but legally you can do it. It's not unlawful. Um, if, a, if a property is already purchased as a joint property, can it be transferred to a trust? How does the bank loan get dealt with, asks Ramesh. So most certainly if it's already in your name and it's your family home, uh, it can be transferred to a trust. And typically the bank debt is adopted by the trust along with the asset. And you gift the difference between the asset value and the bank debt because that's actually your equity, you give that to the trust. Uh, and then over time, uh, you make payments to pay the debt down in lieu of rent. And, uh, and, and the debt just gets eaten away. Now, Anthony, there's been debate over the years, and I think in the last couple of years, we've had debate over whether the payment of the debt in the trust is actually um, 
a deemed gift or a deemed loan. Do you have any um, insight on that for us? Might be getting too deep for this group, but... Yeah, well, it could be either. And so the issue there is with the new trust disclosure rules, if you have a trust that just owns a family trust, you really want to be able to claim that the trust is non-active and not earning any income. Yep. And if the beneficiaries who are living in the property are paying the interest in lieu of rent, that could be deemed income. Now, there's no tax to pay because the amount of income that the trust is given is exactly matched by the amount of expenditure that's paying the bank in return. But it could mean that the trust technically has income and therefore is non-active. Um, so what we would say is that it would be better to treat the transfers of funds from the beneficiaries as either a gift or a loan. So it could be either really your election, but I would suggest a gift. And that way you are making it clear that it's not a form of rent. Okay. The passing resolution recording what it is. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew says, how do you formalize a gift? Well, you write a, a declaration of what you're doing. So if I bank money into a bank account, uh, and I say nothing, it's most likely to be deemed a loan advance. But if I was to write on the payee gift, um, there's an indication that it's a gift. And then I prepare a trust resolution saying the trustees record um, the gift declared by Andrew. And then Andrew might write a letter to the trustees saying, I'm gifting you the sum of X dollars. So that's evidence of the gift and that's all it needs to be. Um, I do um, see lawyers who are very form driven um, prepare a deed of acknowledgement of debt and then a deed of forgiveness of debt. Uh, that also works as well, but it doesn't need to legally be that formal. You can just write it down and say, oh, I'm declaring a gift, and this sum on this date is a gift to you, and the trustees in prayer um, record a resolution receiving it. It's as simple as that. Um, I have a trust um, set up currently with a corporate trustee. The corporate trustee has 100% shareholding of an LTC with three rental properties. Um, I also own my own occupied home in my name. I'm looking to shift this property into the trust. Would you advise creating a new trust to shift this into or using the existing trust? Well, Evan, we need to know a bit more about your banking, but if you want to put split loan structures in place, um, a separate family trust for your home would be better because then you any banking that is residual over your family home can be quarantined away from the banking of those rental units. Also, oh, hang on, you've got an LTC owned by a trust. Mm. No, actually, I think um, is, you need to look at whether the banker in the LTC has taken the existing trust's guarantee. And if it has, most likely has, then your family home, if you put it in that existing trust, would be exposed to that banker. So if you've got low gearing over all, there's probably no risk in that because it's just rental properties. And if you're very comfortable with your liquidity, then I don't see any downside in putting your rental property um, up into that existing family trust and just manage your costs down. But if you want a paranoid approach and if your gearing's a bit higher, separate family trust would give you um, that outcome. Anthony, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only if you're also if you're splitting between banks, obviously you get probably the best outcome having the home and separate trust. Yeah, if you're putting split loan structures, you 100% need the separate trust. Yeah. Um, time frame that MSD looks back, it's forever, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long is the thirteen thousand five hundred in place? It used to be twenty seven. They're different things. The twenty seven thousand was gift duty. Thirteen thousand five hundred is the uh, MSD's policy on gifting for eligibility for free rest home fees. They're different things. If your lending was in the name of the trust, therefore not your personal loan, um, but you pay back that trust loan, do you still have to gift it in? Uh, well, Titma, anything that you do that is a disposition of your equity into a trust needs to be gifted for it to get rid of the, the liability of the trust to you and to give you asset protection. So whatever you haven't gifted to that trust, you're going to have to give to that trust is the short answer to that question. I think I'll oh, well, do this GSA question because it brings us up to the current slide. Um, how do you put a GSA as a security to a loan from a trust? What extra steps 
does it involve comparing to just lending $2 million from a trust? So I'll repeat that again. How do you put up a GSA as security to the loan from the trust? I think you asked the same, you asked the same question twice. So Daniel, um, when you lend the money from the trust to the company, that is a loan advance. Now, security is only attached to new money. So you've actually got to put the security in place and then advance the money. So of course, you're going to take legal advice as you do this and your lawyers are going to put this together for you. But the key is, if you've already got loan advances out to a company, then you can't just put a GSA over it and think that you've got security. You won't have security. You've got to actually repay the money and re-advance it subject to the securities. So that's the key thing. But um, in answer to your questions, before you advance money, you put your securities in place between the lender, which is the trust, and the borrower, which is the company. And uh, then you advance the money. And then the money is advanced subject to the securities and it's protected by the securities. Shai says, oh, I'm a first time buyer buying jointly with my partner. I intend to buy multiple properties in the future. Should we use a trust or joint ownership? Uh, Shy, start off as you intend to go on. It's really expensive and can be problematic tax wise to move assets around later. So I think you should buy your first home directly into a trust. Um, and then you don't have to pay for the additional cost of conveying it later. You don't have to muck around with refinancing it. It's much cheaper and easier just to set it up at the beginning. Um, and then gift your deposit into the trust and then that's done. Um, later, when you buy those rental properties, you can take advice on whatever the prevailing uh, laws are on the day. If there's tax changes, who knows, we might be back to LTCs or um, using the structures we've discussed tonight. We can plan that for you in the future. Uh, Sandeep says, what if a bank loan was used to create assets of the company backed by a shareholder? Uh, will the bank have the upper hand? I think you're saying, what if the loan is um, securitized by assets of the shareholder? Um, will the bank have the upper hand in that $2 million? Well, if the bank has security over the asset, yes, they're always going to be able to control what's going on. So quite often the structures that we want you to create, you can't create because the bank won't let you. So it's a function of setting, um, setting the, your goals, if you like, and sometimes it might take a year or two or even longer to get the ultimate structures in place. Uh, while the banking environment's really conservative, you might not be able to get split loan structures to work. But as, as you come out the back of a recession and asset values really start to go up again, the banks want to lend money, you find those sorts of structures are easier to put in place. So it's, um, you know, we, we give you structures that are aspirational and then you've got to deal with the cards that you're playing with. Um, and be realistic, and we can't always get everything we want. Um, should the family home always be in a separate trust apart from business trusts, and should separate structures be created if an investment property is owned in Australia? Asks Ruan. Well, um, short then, there's a lot in that, but we always put the home in a separate family trust with an estate plan running through it, and then we quarantine the banking and the risk into separate companies in a business trust. That's pretty generic. But if your affairs are not sophisticated, if you have a low scale of borrowings, for example, um, and there's not a lot of debt and there's not a lot of risk because you, your businesses are smaller, then it might be possible to run a single trust. Um, something we've talked about tonight is corporate trustees. We probably should have had a slide on that. Corporate, corporate trustees are companies that act as trustees. And the advantage of them is that if you want to change your trustee, it's just to change a shareholder with a trust resolution. So you, you do a share transfer. But if you have, for example, your lawyer or accountant in, in their own name, uh, to move them to change lawyer or accountant, you have to go to the land transfer office and update the titles, you have to refinance and get the finance in the new trustee's name, pain in the neck. So always use a corporate trustee, even in a family trust, they're cheap to set up. And it means if you want to change a trustee, it's quick and easy and flexible. Um, is an LTC the way to properly invest, asks Vin. As discussed earlier, no, those are not the way to go at the moment. The uh, tax, um, the LTCs are not in vogue and the structures we've discussed tonight, depending on your circumstances, are more likely to apply. 
And if you really want to get to the heart of it, come and see us and we'll have a look at your affairs and tell you the best structure. Um, if settlers make a gift to the trust, do you need to inform the IRD of the gift or will documenting the nature of the gift suffice? Um, if you, Ross, if you just declare a gift, that's all you need to do. Um, gift duties repealed, so there's no reporting on that stuff anymore. Um, so it's voluntary. Yeah, although it will be picked up at the end of the year now in the new trust disclosures. So it, depending on if the trust is active or not, if it's not active, then there won't be any disclosure to the IRD. But if you make a gift to an active trust, then that's a settlement, and so that all that will be picked up. That's a, a, the point is though that doesn't uh, help affect the gift. That's just disclosing the fact that there has been a gift. Yeah, and the consequence of non-disclosure is pretty much nothing anyway. The, the rules are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll write to you and say, you haven't disclosed, and you write back and say, oh, you're right, we're now disclosing, and that's the end of it. So there's no teeth in the legislation. Um, I, I find that legislation very annoying. Um, I won't get onto this government, but you know what they've done to tax and administration is not good. I deduce from the talk that forming a trust is better than forming a company. Well, Jag, um, the trust is where you want the ultimate ownership to reside, but where you pay tax is a function of your individual circumstances. If you're wanting to income split, direct ownership in a trust is better. If you're wanting to um, use the corporate tax rate, then uh, at 28%, then ownership of a company is better. So it's about how you put the structures together. Is the company owned by the trust? Is the company owned by you? Is the company an LTC? How do you bank it? How, do you, how does your spouse relate to it? So it's not a simple one-line answer. We need to analyze the situation and say, well, that's the best permutation of these structures. And what we've done tonight is show you 10 different structures with 10 different case studies. And if you look through those case studies and see what which correlate to your circumstances there might be some useful information in that for you but there's no one approach fits all that's not how this works you've actually got to look at your circumstances and work it out and that's the role of a firm like GRA we work it out for you uh, Daniel asks a more specific question we have recently purchased a section to build a family house the bank requested to transfer the existing home loan from a different bank for our townhouse so we now have two loans with one bank, presumably over the same asset, Daniel. Uh, both, uh, oh, so you've got two properties actually. Both properties have grown in value. My, my wife would like to use the equity from our two properties and increase the home loan to purchase a business. We don't have any trust. Um, what would be the best way to approach it to avoid some of the disasters you're talking about? set up a family trust and a business trust and how to deal with the bank, Kiwi Bank in this case. Well, Daniel, I can, I can say um, Kiwi Bank are a great bank to deal with. I, I deal with them. And, uh, you know, take advantage of our free workshop, um, sit down with one of our guys like Anthony or one of his team, and we'll go through your specific circumstances. But indicatively, family home to a family trust, we need to understand more about what that second property is. Is it a batch? Is it an investment property? And um, all, we need to look ahead too, because you just heard David Seymour, both act and national, intend to repeal interest non deduction rules. Uh, so it might be that we try and load the debt over the rental property, hoping that next year they repeal those rules and you get a deduction. Whether that's going into a company or a trust will be a function of your individual circumstances. So that's the sort of thing that we can dig into one-to-one. -one. Um, is there a way to offset crypto paper profits where the profit has dropped due to volatility of the asset class, qualifying the profits for tax accounting? Um, so you've got a business that's trading crypto, the profits are taxable, the losses are deductible. Um, Anthony, do you have anything to add to that? You, if you well, the, the, the the key word that I heard, heard there, Matthew, was I heard the word paper profit. No. Uh, uh, or oh, paper so it's unrealized. Yeah, it's so unrealized. Un unrealized movements in value of crypto are ignored for tax purposes. It's only once you dispose of the crypto, so you either cash into a fiat currency or swap your Bitcoin for Ethereum, 
only and buy then, it back. Yeah. Only then do you dispose of uh, the crypto, and therefore at that point, any difference between the proceeds of that disposal and your original cost is either going to be a profit or a loss, and uh, in all likelihood, either taxable or claimable. Yeah, and so if if he sold his uh, Bitcoin and booked a loss and then bought it back the next day, that would be a crystallization and loss, wouldn't it? Correct. Yeah, so just sell it and buy it back. Uh, regarding rest home subsidies and the value of the home being gifted into the trust, is it the purchase price, say say what, what it cost 10 years ago, or is it the current market value? Mm, well, Paul, if you, it's, it's current market value and, and it's a, it's at the value on the day you're transferring it into the trust. Yeah, I think that's the key. It's the value on the day that you transferred in. If it was transferred in 10 years ago, it's the value at that point. It doesn't matter what it's worth today. If you're talking about transferring it today, then it doesn't matter what it was worth 10 years ago. Yeah, Bobby Lynn has continued with some interesting questions. And unfortunately, they're, they're sort of around development and, and will Brightline apply to development properties? The Brightline does not apply to development property if you're developing to resell, because that is revenue account, it's taxable if you sell it. But if you're developing to hold, um, that's a different kettle of fish. You'll have the new build bright line rules applying, which are five years. Yeah. Um, and it's best, Bobby, to develop in the entity that you intend to hold everything in long term, because if you develop in, in your name and you sell some and keep some, for example, which is a common thing to do, you taint the properties that you're holding. So if you develop, say, 10 properties, keep five and sell five, and the five that you've sold get cashed up, that's fine. The five that you're keeping, you then want to put them in a trust. You can't move them for 10 years because they are tainted for 10 years. They're taxable through association to the trading activity for 10 years. So specific advice in that area, Bobby, is really important. Um, again, Take advantage of our free meeting or tell you about it. Um, do the gifting rules apply to gifting made from someone else? Uh, no, not for rest home fees. MSD, if, if somebody else gifted money to your trust to, to pay down debt on your family home, or if they gifted you a family home, uh, MSD are not going to look at that as a disposition of wealth from you. Um, so they're going to, that. They're, that would assist you if that's the angle you're going at. Um, Kenny says, if I divide a house into two to obtain tax relief on interest payments, what criteria is required for the IRD? Two titles or just dividing the wall? So this is the definition of a new build to get interest deductibility. Anthony, perhaps you could speak to that. Yep. So if you have an existing dwelling that is uh, one dwelling, so it's classified as one self-contained dwelling, and you then make the necessary physical alterations so that there are two self-contained dwellings, that whole property then qualifies as a new build. Interest in relation to that will be deductible. What do you need to have? Well, you need to have CCC issued showing that now there are two self-contained dwellings there. Perfect. You don't need to have two titles. So um, that's your answer, Kenny. There's some good advice there. Uh, trust with one person who is the set or trustee and one of a group of beneficiaries, a Sam asks James Buckland. Uh, answer, not necessarily. Um, I know Ross Holmes sets his trust up like that and argues vehemently and cites case law to say that such arrangements are not a sham. But what we would say about that is the um, duties on you as trust as a trustee to prove that you're acting independently, um, given it's quite circular. You know, one day you own the property in your name, the next day you own it in your name because you're now a trustee and you're purporting to be the settler of a trust, now acting as trustee instead of personal ownership for the other beneficiaries. Well, if your paperwork is immaculate and you can show that that's true, then that is a valid trust. But we don't like it. We would prefer you to have an independent trustee or at least a second trustee and make sure either way that you have good minutes and resolutions to, to back up the fact that you are a you, know, you, you are acting independently and properly as a trustee. Uh, are bear trust agreements still common and used to own property for income personally 
while the asset protection is still in a trust, asks Logan. Yeah, Logan, so Logan, um, Logan's speaking to a circumstance where you want to put something into a trust, but you can't because the bank won't refinance you or there's some, some issue there um, that precludes you from moving the asset because uh, the bank won't allow it. And so what you can do is you can do all the paperwork and gift it to a trust and then do a declaration of trust, declaring that you hold it as a bear trustee for the trust moving forwards. So it's a bear trust, a declaration of ownership that you hold it as a bear trustee for a trust. And when you do that, uh, it is now the trust property. You're acting as the agent of the trust, a bear trustee. And so you're getting your asset protection and later when the bank um, is satisfied, you can then change the title. So is that common? It's not uncommon. Um, you know, we see that done. Uh, it still requires disclosure to the bank, um, but it's not uncommon. Uh, Gareth says, great slides, Matthew. Thanks for the subject matter, Anthony. That's good. Um, can a GSA be created for any loan, i.e. for a joint venture with another party? Uh, yes, it, yes, it certainly can. And uh, sometimes you want a second mortgage or a first mortgage as well. And somebody asked earlier, what is better, mortgage or GSA? Well, both. You want both. And you can put a GSA and a mortgage over any asset and any entity. And if and Bob, if I was funding the JV and a third party is my JV partner, I would certainly want a GSA and second mortgage uh, or first mortgage. That makes me much safer if my JV partner mucks around. Uh, should my home loan interest payment and repayments be routed through the family trust and gifted as I go. This is the only trust I have, which has one property and will soon have three rentals as well. What do you think of that, Anthony? Well, we'll assume that the borrowing is in the trust because if the loan's personally, then it obviously will not go through the, the trust. Mm. Um, and if we're talking about the private home loan, then yeah, I think you should at this point in time document the payments you're making uh, to meet the trust's obligation as a gift. Yep. Okay. Uh, Shamila says, hello, my spouse and I own a rental property and it's in a company. I'm paying the mortgage completely. What are the merits and demerits on this aspect? Uh, so it's an ordinary company. You are advancing the money to the company to pay the shortfall on the rental property, I'm presuming. So the tenants pay some money. It's not enough to cover interest and principal. So you advance more. And uh, the answer to your question is, what are the merits of that? Well, we need to know more. Are you tax positive or tax negative? I presume you're tax negative. So um, I, I think if interest non-deduction stays in, and you lose interest deductibility on that money, assuming it's not um, a new build, it's secondhand goods, then you want to be in a company. It's going to work for you because you're paying tax on the uh, net yield, rent minus operating expenses, not the net cash flow. So you will be tax positive, even though you're really tax negative, really cash flow negative, you'll be tax positive in those circumstances. So the company is highly likely to be better um, but we need to know more, Shamila, because, for example, if it is going to be tax positive, who owns the shares? You want the ability to flow the income to the person that's got the lower marginal tax rate exposure. So I'm going to go full circle and say not enough information. But generally, a company is pretty good. An ordinary company, not an LTC, is optimal with these interest on deduction rules because they're creating very tax positive portfolios if those rules stay in. Hopefully, they get thrown out. Um, Stephen asks, uh, the trust vesting date, what is the maximum life of a trust in New Zealand? It used to be 80 years, it's now 125 years. So if you have an existing trust, you can vary the trust deed to update it, to extend the perpetuities period to 125 years. And that's something we do for our clients. We review their trusts and make sure that all of the uh, um, clauses in the trust are modern and up-to-date and uh, extend your perpetuities period out. 
Um, if you already have a rental property trust um, where you intend to pass properties on to your children, what's your question, Paul? If you have already a rental property trust where you intend to pass properties on to children, oh, here's the second part of the question. At what age do you need to set up the trust for the children? Um, well, Paul, I think it's when the money goes through. So if you're not going to give it to them until you die, uh, do it when you die. But if you're going to give them money early, um, pass the money through um, and bear a trust early. So I've got a nine-year-old daughter. I set her up a trust and I got a, well, it was two years ago. I set her up a trust when she was nine and I set my son up a trust when he was 16. And I bought them a couple of rental properties um, held in a company between the two trusts. So they're now making money out of property. I've lent them, lent their trust the money, that have lent the company the money, and their my thoughts are that in 10 years' time they can sell the rental properties and use the money to buy houses. I've given them a start. So rather than doing that in their personal names, which would be impossible because they're too young or imprudent because they might get married or go broke, I've set the trust up early. But if I was to wait until I die to give them the money, then I'd wait and do it via the memory and number of washers. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I would like to set up a meeting to review and move forwards. Uh, would I get you for a meeting or your employees? Well, Mary, I presume you're talking to Anthony, <laughs> who's the partner. I can assure you, anybody you get here are amazing at this. Was a, this is an area of expertise, uh, but you know, just. Put your request through and um, we'll see what we can do. Uh, Bobby's come back and says, I'm a new developer. If I hold some new builds from a large development, will, will Brightline apply if I hold them for longer than five years? How should I structure my entities? So I thought that's where you were, where you were driving things, Bobby. So Bobby, if you claim GST on everything, then everything is taxable under um, ordinary income tax principles. And unfortunately, when you claim tax on everything, you're declaring to the government that it's taxable and it's taxable forever to your group. So to get out of that is actually quite difficult. Uh, the better way to do it is to tell the government that you're only going to um, sell half or whatever percentage you're going to keep and then only claim GST on half your costs. And when you sell, only sell the half. And then you are taxable for 10 years through tainting. I said that before, I guess that's what you were wondering. It is a very complicated question and very complicated answer. And I gave you the short version. Um, I recommend you come in and we'll give you um, some insight on that. Uh, that is a one-to-one -one discussion, that one. Are there any vocabulary available for those terms that you're using like right line GSA? Hmm. Um, sorry, Daniel. We just assume that if you watch um, if you watch the tax changes webinar that we showed you earlier, it's on our web. We we go a lot slower and go through the stuff in detail. And for example, Anthony defines what bright line is, and and um, you'll go into it a bit deeper. In terms of GSA, um, you'd have to come in for a meeting one to one for that sort of stuff. Uh, it's general security agreement and. It's a security arrangement that gives you the benefits I was talking to you about. Um, you can also talk to your lawyer about it. Um, Hi, Anthony, what is interest? Um, what is the interest deductibility for this case? Um, we own two rental properties, both bought for 600,000 each, which is 1.2 million. Um, one is rented to social housing and one is rented to the general public. The loan amount is 1 million to Bank A at 4% interest how to calculate how much interest to use for deductibility on Tonji. I can answer that, but uh, Anthony, I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, the first point is we'll assume that they're both owned in the same entity, company or trust or individually. Yep. And what the, the expectation of the legislation is, is that you will trace, be able to trace of your one, 0.2 or 1 million debt, whatever you said it was, be able to trace how much of that was borrowed to buy the property that's now rented out as social housing, how much was borrowed to buy the property that was um, uh, that has now been rented out to, to tenants. And if you can't trace, then there is provision to 
uh, load more borrowing onto the exempt asset, the social housing one, uh, but you need to be careful about that. So the, the first thing is tracing is the principle and the expectation is that most people should be able to do that unless they have held the properties for many years and they've gone through multiple refinances and then we've got to look at alternatives. But that's very much then dependent on case by case as to what your options are for uh, allocating that debt. Yeah, so for example, if um, the properties, um, or oh, actually the cost is, is disclosed here at 600,000, uh, but you know another another example of how to get to where you're trying to um, get to is you could sell them to a trust using rollover relief and loan all the debt over them if the debt has been mixed with your family home, losing deductibility, which is what Anthony's driving at. So you might have to recharacterize them by using a new transaction to create new tracing to directly show that it's deductible. Um, so it's, it's situational and we need the facts to give you the full answer. Do we have, uh, do we need a proof of letter? Do we need proof through a letter from a social housing provider who's renting our property to claim interest deductibility? Yes, you do. Um, you need to show that they're a community housing provider or a registered CHP, or they are a subsidiary of KO or um, Ministry of Urban Health and Development. That's right, isn't it, Anthony? Yep. Yeah, so just because they're not a CHP doesn't mean that they're not a social housing provider, but the public statements sort of lead you to think that they must be a CHP, but actually, the definition of a CHP is a registered CHP or a subsidiary of MHUD or um, one of these registered agencies. So um, it's a little bit wider than just a community housing provider. Um, so many, another question you should ask is how do you insure those social housing buildings when you rent them out to social housing providers? Because that can be quite tough. And that's something that we've cracked here at GRA, um, Initio, who is one of our insurance providers, they've got policy cover for it. And uh, Rothbury's also have policy cover for it. So, um, and also in my portfolio, um, they just treat the, they treat my larger portfolio as commercial. And so they'll write me a commercial policy, which is the same cost as a residential policy. But because I've got lots of houses, they'll just um, write me a single policy with one insurance company split across all the different owners of the, of the properties. So there's a lot of talk in the media at the moment about non-insurability of social housing and it's nonsense. You just got to get the right broker. Um, if you bought your home as your main home, but do not stay in it due to unforeseen circumstances, for example, you've got a work transfer to another city, so you're renting and you had to rent your own home um, and you still get the main home exemption asks for read. That's for you, Anthony. Unfortunately, intention's not enough. You need to actually occupy it. So if you intend to buy something as your home, but you end up not moving into it, then the, the original intention for that to be your main home does not provide you any relief under the Bright Line rules. Mm. It's one of, one of the real shortcomings. We've had a number of clients who have bought property 100% intended for it to be their home. Uh, by the time that settlement comes around, or maybe they bought it off the plans, by the time completion arrives, unforeseen circumstances mean they can't move into it and they end up being caught by Brightline for entering into a transaction which for all intents and purposes was a private home transaction and they're only having to sell because of unanticipated circumstances. Unfortunately, there's just no compassion or relief in the rules for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the time is 9.40. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll cut off at 9.45. We'll do five more minutes. We have 60 questions open and we've answered 55. And as fast as we answer them, they, they list grows. So we'll give it another five minutes. Anna says, for new build and interest deductibility, if you add another bedroom, does it satisfy new build criteria? What are some repairs, improvements you could make that could constitute a new build? I'm aware repadding 
of 30% or more. Is it 30%? I thought it was um, 75%. Yeah. You're right, 75%. Yeah, so any you've got to reclad 75% for it to qualify as a new build. Um, but over to you, Anthony. Adding a room? No, that will not constitute a, a new build. So you have to you have to have uh, evidence that uh, via a CCC uh, being issued that there's a new self-contained dwelling on the land. Mm. A, a new bedroom's not going to cut it. So Anna, if you picked the house up and moved it down the back of the section, that would be a new CCC. That'd be a new build, even though it's the existing dwelling. You moved it and got a CCC. And then presumably you would have created space and you could build another one on the front. And then that additional dwelling would also be a new build, but moving it down the back actually is a new house for the purposes of interest deductibility. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So um, it's a pretty extreme tax strategy, but uh, you could move your house down the back of your section. That'll work. <laughs> if a rental property is owned by the trust and a renovation has been done, do I have to detail each transaction? Asks Janice. No, you just prepare a, a minute saying that the trustees have renovated the dwelling and they've spent 50 grand and they um, and are satisfied that they got value for money and it's in the interest of beneficiaries. Um, and it's as simple as that. You're just showing that you were acting as a trustee and not a private individual, so your trust is not a sham. Hi, is a garage that has been converted into a consented self-contained minor dwelling considered as a new build and able to claim back the interest deductibility? Well, if you've got a new CCC, because it is a separate dwelling now, then I'd say yes. Yep, I, I agree. If it's a, if it's a legally uh, accepted, consented, self-contained dwelling with CCC issued on or after 27 March 2020. That's what the rules refer to. I don't think it matters if it looks like a garage from the outside. Yeah, so timing is, is important there. Catherine mm -hmm. says, if you, look, if you have a look-through company with 99-1 shareholding between husband and wife, can you change to 50-50 shareholding? Hmm, these used to be so easy, these questions. You just say yes, uh, but now you've got to consider is the disposal of shares the disposal of property for Brightline? And if you do, do you reset the Brightline clock? And um, do you lose interest deductibility? And, and so I'll ask Anthony. <laughs> That's a hard question. Yeah, and those you've hit the nail on the head there, Matthew. A movement of shares in an LTC is deemed movement of the underlying property. So whoever owned 99% of the shares, they'll be deemed to sell 49% of the property. So if the property was bought two years ago, subject to Brightline, it's gone up in value, there'll be tax to pay, um, the, there'll be a loss of interest deductibility, and there's no rollover relief on moving shares in an LTC. Now, there's one other point of detail here though if the reason for moving from 99.1 to 50.50 is because there's a desire um, for the couple to equalize their assets for relationship property purposes if they get a formal relationship property agreement that means independent advice from two lawyers and they sign an agreement and pursuant to that agreement the shares are, uh, are transferred so that they're split 50.50 then you get rollover relief then you don't have those issues yeah, and, and that'd be the prudent way to approach that. So you'd use a Section 21 agreement with your lawyer. Uh, another thing you could do is you could transfer the property from the LTC to yourselves using rollover relief. Uh, is there a deemed disposal here, Anthony? No, but it's got to then be held 99-1 tenants in common. So unfortunately, that's not going to help us get to 50-50. And what if we then did a second leg of that, went from the individuals to the trust using rollover, rollover relief a second time? Yeah, well, in fact, we if we wanted to get into a trust, we could go from the LTC to the trust. We don't need to do the two-stepper. Oh, yeah, okay. But yeah, whether, whether, whether that trust ownership satisfies, of course, the, the question was going to 50-50, but um, yeah. yeah, trust is another option there. And, and actually, what this highlights is how ridiculous New Zealand tax rules are now. Look how complex such a simple thing has become. Yeah. These tax changes are bizarre. They are ridiculous. you got two guys that are 
25 years in tax that know the stuff inside out and we're scratching our heads. Um, did the politicians really intend this? Did they really intend to cause you the cost of hiring people like us to answer questions like that? It's just lunacy. These rules need to go. Uh, we're known to, this will be the last question. Uh, we're known to says, if the family home was bought 10 years ago with no debt, but now used as a rental property with mortgages security and bought another family home, can the new mortgage interest on the old property be deductible on the rental property, which was family home for 10 years? <laughs> yeah, so you've, you've, these are those pricing rules that Anthony was talking about. Why did, you buy, why did you borrow the money? So you trace the purpose of the money to the asset that the money was used to buy. So here you have presumably, because you haven't given us details of structures, presumably the assets are owned in your name or jointly with your spouse. And presumably you have then um, purchased in your names or your spouse's name, your new family home, the money that you've borrowed traces to that new family home. So therefore the interest is non-deductible. So in order to convert the debt to, to become deductible, you would need to move the old family home, which is now a rental property, to an entity that you're gonna get rollover relief on and borrow the money in that entity. And the new debt is probably gonna be non-deductible, Anthony, because- Yeah, yeah, rollover relief is not gonna help us. That yeah. just that, that yeah. just helps um, maintain what the existing outcome was. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're really uh, limiting yeah. our options here unless the, the existing home is rented out as social housing, for example, or there's a change of government next year, it's possibly your best hope. Mm, yeah, I mean, I think in that situation, you'd want to sell the existing home, and buy a new build, and then borrow the money over that, and pay the debt down on your existing home. You know, that could be a way around it. And, and you know, that just highlights how, um, again, how complex these rules are. Uh, but it also shows that with a bit of lateral thinking, the solution might not be dealing with the assets you've got. It might be to throw them out and start again with the right structure um, and, and stay alert because the, the rules are changing. And uh, all the time with this government and next year with um, Act of National Empower, hopefully, um it's all going to change again and um and david seymour was wrong about one thing um every time they change all these rules to simplify things that's actually really good for gra <laughs> it's so complicated um you know and your normal your normal accountants just can't keep up they are pretty complicated rules that we're dealing with here and if you don't have a tax team that just concentrate on the stuff um, the normal property accountant struggle. They have to go to specialists. And we have that expertise in-house. Well, look, I think that's enough. Um, you guys have done very well. There's still a couple hundred of you online. Uh, and we're, we're coming up to hour number three. So thanks, everybody, for your attention. And I uh, hope you got value from this. Um, we'll see you on the next webinar. Uh, thanks, everybody, and good night. And thank you, Anthony Lipscomb. Excellent, as always. No worries. Um, thank you. We will see you later. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye.